I know we are short of time today, and we have many things going on in other parts of the Congress, so I'm going to be short and turn this over to my ranking member for a few comments before we uh, officially organize. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is good to be here. Uh, I can tell you I am very excited about the next two years and what we're going to accomplish together on the Commerce Committee. I'm looking forward to working with our chairman, Senator Cantwell. Uh, she and I got together for lunch last week, and we've agreed that we are going to regularly get together and work to try to find areas of bipartisan cooperation. This, this committee has a long history of moving forward bipartisan legislation that is pro-jobs, that is pro-economic growth. This committee has enormous jurisdiction over nearly half of the U.S. economy. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with Chairman Cantwell and all of the members of this committee on both the Democrat side and the Republican side for a very productive two years. I likewise want to welcome our new member members, Senator Welch, Senator Budd, uh, Senator Schmidt, Senator Vance. Welcome to this committee. We are going to be a busy and active committee. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. And are we ready to move to the motion? Yes. Thank you, Senator Cruz. All right, then I move that the rules governing the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Trans Transportation and that the budget resolution for the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation be reported favorably. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The motion is agreed to and votes have now concluded. Thanks everybody for helping us get a quorum and getting organized for this very important committee. We will now turn to the hearing before us, and I'd like to call up the witnesses to the table if I could. We are going to welcome Paul Hudson, President of Flyers Rights, Captain Casey Murray, President of Southwest Airlines Pilot Association, Andrew Watterson, Chief Operating Officer for Southwest Airlines, Sharon Pinkerton, Senior Vice President, Legislative Regulatory Policy for Airlines for America, and Dr. Clifford Winston, Senior Fellow of the Brookings Institute, who will be joining us remotely today. So we are looking forward to hearing your, your testimony and uh, the ability to interact with you on questions. So if the witnesses could come to the table, please. Okay, thank you all for being here. When Winter Storm Elliott hit, U.S. travelers experienced an airline debacle of enormous proportions. While bad weather can happen and is expected, and many airlines recovered quickly, Southwest stood out on its scope of the problems it faced. Over two million Southwest passengers suffered consequences, separated from family and friends, not to mention their luggage, and hundreds of thousands of people stranded at airports across the country. We know that many of them had no clear instructions about what to do next. For example, I heard from many of my constituents in the state of Washington about these issues. I heard from a coach of Rainier High School basketball team in Seattle. He and his wife went through a tremendous ordeal. It's very important that we understand that consumers do like Southwest Airlines point-to-point -point service. They like that the airline does have many benefits, and they like the friendly flight that they get from their pilots and many of their workers. But Coach Bethy and his wife and traveling party of more than two dozen players and parents traveled to Las Vegas on Southwest for a holiday basketball tournament. They were scheduled to fly back to Seattle on December 23rd, but Southwest canceled the flight. 
When Coach Bethea and his wife contacted Southwest, they were basically told, you're on your own. And they were on their own, all of them. All of those kids and parents stuck in Las Vegas trying to figure out what to do next. They needed hotel rooms, they needed meals, they wanted to try to figure out if they could to salvage their Christmas holiday. They ended up stranded in Las Vegas for five days, spending more than $10,000 on hotels and food and with no idea how they might get back home. Mercifully, a friend offered to front the cost of a charter bus, and finally, 18 hours later, through the snow, they made it back to Seattle. Here's what really struck me, though, when I talked to the coach and his wife and many other people I have talked to. They wanted to know, after their flight was canceled, what were the alternatives? What could they do to get back home, particularly because it was the holiday season? And even though they were missing time with family and friends at Christmas, they also wanted to know about those out-of-pocket expenses, thousands of dollars that they wanted to make sure that they received some information about on how they might get reimbursed. When I spoke to Coach Bethea and his wife recently, they wanted to ask one question. Mr. Watterson, they wanted me to ask you, and I know you're a busy guy, but what they really wanted was for you to call them. Like many of our consumers, they felt like they were getting the short end of the stick. They didn't know how to communicate to anyone to answer their questions on how long they were stuck. I know that many of these issues Mr. Hudson is going to talk about and will have some ideas. I know we're going to hear about how we can move consumers around more effectively. But doing better also means that making sure that we're not going to give consumers the short end of the stick. We need to make sure we're investing in technology and the surge capacity that I'm sure we're going to hear about. And I'm sure we're going to hear about what could have been done before this that would have helped. We're always going to have these weather events. And some of us believe they're going to become more severe. But what we want is to have a system that is ready to address that and to talk about the alternatives. Captain Murray, president of the Southwest Airline Pilots Association, will tell us for years there was warnings of the need to modernize the outdated the IT system that was dated. I hope Mr. Watterson can explain why those warnings went unheard. From mandatory oversight, oh, I'm sorry, mandatory overtime shifts, there was a stretch into all these conditions, and I do want to thank all the workers that worked those many hours to try to help this recover. I know many of my constituents said how grateful they were for the individual workers who showed compassion and tried to help them. But I do believe this sector needs a more effective policeman on the beat. They need someone over at the Department of Transportation who is going to get the job done. When we need to make sure that consumers are consulted, that their reimbursement fees aren't continually being held up, or as the president said the other night, making sure that children get the access to seat next to their parents. I know that these things seem like very basic consumer issues, but somehow they have been taken for granted. And I think that this incident shows us that we have to get serious about this. Our committee has the opportunity to implement change, resiliency, in an air transportation system that every member of this committee values. We value it and we want to grow it, but we can't do it on the backs of consumers. So Mr. Waters, Mr. Waterson, if you will call my constituent, I will feel better that you will be hearing the real voices of consumers directly. Thank you. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and welcome uh, to each of the witnesses at this hearing. Uh, a few moments ago, I referenced uh, the bipartisan and pro-jobs legislation that this committee will be moving forward over the next two years. Right at the top of that list uh, is going to be reauthorizing the Federal Aviation Administration. And it is a real opportunity for this committee to focus on aviation safety, and also innovation and ensuring that we have a, a competitive aviation sector that gives consumers what they want, which is low prices and the ability to get where they want to go for work or for play inexpensively and conveniently. Uh, safety, quite rightly, is the top priority of the FAA. 
and we should not be compromising on safety with too many recent near misses. We have to consider how to keep our airspace safe and efficient. Just this past weekend in, in Austin, Texas, uh, there was a near disaster that was averted thanks to the quick reaction of the pilots. But it could have been a horrific day had those, those two planes collided on that runway in Austin. And it is my hope that we use the reauthorization opportunity to push the FAA safety and technology into the 21st century to protect competition and to resist the temptation to get into the business of regulating prices, which will only make air traffic, air travel unaffordable. Um, we all know why we're here today, which is in the middle of the holiday travel rush. Tens of thousands of families, including many Texans, missed Christmases at home, missed weddings, medical procedures, and more. In, due initially to an unavoidable weather event, but prolonged for days because of the very serious failures at Southwest Airlines. Now, I'm a big fan of Southwest Airlines. I spend a lot of time flying Southwest. In fact, I jokingly refer to Southwest as the company plane. It feels like I'm on a Southwest plane once or twice or more a week. And I think Southwest, most days, does a fantastic job. I think Southwest employees consistently greet you with a smile, with a laugh. Southwest flight attendants will sing over the intercom. Uh, Southwest has done an amazing job inculcating customer service throughout a very large institution. All of those are commendable. But when all was said and done, over the Christmas holiday, Southwest had canceled more than 16,000 flights. We'll hear more of an explanation today on what happened. And many people, understandably, were deeply frustrated at not being able to get where they wanted to go, not being able to be with their family. And I've had multiple conversations with senior leadership at Southwest. I'm confident they understand it was an epic screw up and that they are committed to doing everything possible to prevent its recurrence. The airline has already paid out hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds, free future flights, and reimbursements for stranded travelers' out-of-pocket expenses. And the airline's working hard to win back travelers' trust. What I hope to hear today are the specific concrete steps taken by Southwest management to ensure that a similar operations meltdown never happens again. Now, as frustrating as those several days were, the question of whether Southwest has sufficiently made things right will, will ultimately be answered by the flying public. It will be answered by customers choosing whether or not to book a flight on Southwest. Because Southwest was issuing refunds and returning baggage, while they were doing so, some Democrats on this committee were proposing the government step in with overly complex, anti-competitive, and frankly unnecessary regulations that would collectively have the result of making flying unaffordable for many Americans. One of the great changes in our lifetime to commercial aviation is the prices of flights have gone way down so that more and more Americans can afford to travel to see a loved one, to travel to go on vacation with the kids. That's valuable, and instead of rushing to regulate prices and how many drink coupons you get, the Biden Department of Transportation should instead let the flying public vote with their feet. We need to be, as a customer, if I'm not confident of an airline's ability to get me from point A to point B on time, I'll choose a different airline. Southwest knows this, and it's how they have earned so many customers over and over again. 
And the Biden Department of Transportation doesn't seem to have quite the same faith in consumers. Last month, the Department of Transportation announced that it is investigating whether Southwest engaged in, quote, unrealistic scheduling for the holiday season. This provision of law permits the Department of Transportation to decide if a singular route is chronically delayed, which means it is delayed by more than 30 minutes, more than 50% of the time. Never one to let long-standing and well-reasoned precedent stand in the way. The Department of Transportation now plans to investigate the sensibility of the entire schedule, armchair quarterbacking the scheduling and operations of an entire industry. That's just foolish. Regulatory overreach, as egregious as that, would undermine decades of progress in air travel, harming the very consumers that, that DOT claims it's trying to protect. To avoid arbitrary fines, airlines would reduce service to pad their schedules. A world in which the Department of Transportation can deem an entire airline schedule, quote, unrealistic, is a world with fewer flights to smaller airports in Texas, in Montana, in Nevada, in Arizona, and less flexibility and competition for airlines and ultimately higher prices. Notably absent from today's meeting is Secretary Buttigieg. Just a few weeks ago, the FAA had its own epic screw up with the meltdown of the NOTAM system. Under Secretary Buttigieg's watch, the FAA issued the first nationwide ground stop since 9-11, leading to thousands of canceled flights. Now, the Department of Transportation didn't give any mea culpa to impacted travelers. The Biden DOT didn't issue refunds. It didn't issue reimbursements. It just screwed up their flights and then proceeded to say, we want to be in charge of how the airlines behave. Even though the FAA has been non modernizing their NOTAM system since 2012, and Congress has fully funded the NOTAM budget, the FAA predicts they won't finish the modernization until 2030. We need to be defending consumers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Cruz. We'll now turn to our witness, starting with Mr. Hudson. Thank you, welcome. Yeah, if you could push your microphone button, please. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, and committee members, for including the passenger perspective in this important hearing on airline operations and consumer protections. My name is Paul Hudson. I'm here today as president of Flyers Rights, the largest airline passenger advocacy organization. The Southwest Airlines Christmas meltdown, as you know, resulted in 16,700 canceled flights. It impacted directly over 2 million passengers and many more indirectly. It was unprecedented, but not unexpected. Southwest, as well as other airlines, have had past meltdowns due to obsolete technology, lack of reserves of personnel and equipment, lack of stress testing, and unrealistic and deceptive scheduling. The Southwest debacle caused many tens of thousands to be stranded overnight or even for days. They missed important events such as weddings, funerals, holiday gatherings and vacations, work obligations, and even needed medical care. Not to mention the mountains of luggage delayed or lost. Southwest shut down its customer service and could not even communicate with its own employees. The loss to passengers and the economy, which depends on air travel, is well into the billions. Some examples. Diane Martinez needed her epilepsy medicine and had to drive 10 hours from Charleston to Nashville because Southwest had no available flights for days and did not accommodate her on another airline. She had to pay $600 for rental car and hotel stay because of Southwest. There are many more examples. 
Kate D. missed her own wedding despite booking a flight scheduled to land more than two days before her wedding. She estimated that she and her wedding party lost more than $70,000 in hotel rooms alone. Many passengers endured what Christopher Rosales endured, multiple canceled flights, a night at the airport, and spending Christmas Eve in a hotel. Passengers were unable to talk to any airport representative in person, on the phone, or online. All this occurred while other airlines had empty seats. Because US airlines are not required to pay delay compensation for domestic flights, unlike for international air travel, Southwest avoided over half a billion dollars in delay expenses. Under the current system, airlines are actually incentivized to provide bad service. Good service costs money, and bad service saves money. And that money can be used for dividends, stock buybacks, and executive compensation. Southwest proudly chose to be the first airline to restore dividends, paying $428 million in dividends to shareholders in December. Bad press, investigations, low to no fines has not caused it to update its operations. Southwest canceled or delayed half its flights over a few days in June of 21. 1,800 flights in one weekend in October of 21. Most airline operational problems are predictable and preventable. In June, Flyers Wright sent an urgent letter to Secretary Buttigieg with 17 policy proposals, but to our knowledge, nearly none has been acted on. I would like to emphasize three measures this committee could initiate. First is EU-style delay compensation. The second necessary measure is the pre-deregulation reciprocity rule. This rule matched empty seats on other airlines with passengers whose flights were canceled or significantly delayed at no extra charge. This mitigates delays and consumer harm is self-executing and rewards airlines with reliable service while penalizing those without. Flyers Rights previously filed a formal rulemaking petition with the DOT, but this was denied as unnecessary by Secretary Chow. The mantra at the time was airline competition will solve all problems. Finally, I would urge this committee to take decisive action to revisit the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978. The current airline anti, and also current airline antitrust practices. Unintended consequences lie behind most current air travel dysfunction. This can be done by establishment of a bipartisan commission or select committee to study the current state of air travel and propose needed reforms in the next six to 12 months. I last recall testifying before this committee shortly after 9-11. This committee then forged a bipartisan consensus. In a matter of weeks, it persuaded a reluctant House majority and president to enact structural reform in aviation security. There has not been a successful aviation bombing or hijacking since. You have the power and you should have the motivation to take decisive action to overcome the present crises in air travel operations and consumer protection. Thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to your questions and to hear the ideas of members and other witnesses. Before I turn to Captain Murray, I, I forgot to call on my colleagues for the subcommittee uh, chair and ranking member. I know Senator Moran isn't here, but we'll allow him to put a statement in the record. But Senator Duckworth, if you wanted to give a statement. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Cruz for holding today's hearing. Um, uh, next month actually marks my 30th year as a pilot uh, from when I first showed up at flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama. So I'm incredibly excited to serve as chair of the subcommittee on aviation safety operations and innovation, having flown as a military pilot, as a civilian pilot, uh, uh, as um, uh, a general aviation aircraft owner. Um, I've flown from civilian airfields, military airfields, civil military airfields. I commanded um, the Black Hawk unit out of Midway Airport, flying in between Southwest Airlines <laughs> on the pad between the fours, taken off from there. Those of you who know, um, South, uh, knew, know Midway real well. Um, it is my personal mission to make sure that we craft an FAA reauthorization that will strengthen safety 
that will bolster the aviation workforce, that will hold the FAA accountable for finally modernizing its air traffic control technology. And consistent with today's hearing, we must also crack down on carriers that have gone away with predatory practices that treat customers like suckers and view passengers with disabilities as disposable. Every commercial airline, American airline, um, has broken one of my wheelchairs. Every one of them. Uh, we need to end that practice. Now is a critical time for our nation's commercial aviation industry. From the deadly Boeing 737 MAX crashes to the FAA's self-inflicted meltdown of its NOTAM system, to the utter collapse of Southwest Airlines operations, blamed on the same weather that every other carrier managed to navigate. Americans' confidence in every facet of our civil aviation ecosystem has plummeted. Today's hearing is hopefully a first step towards rebuilding a foundation that will begin to restore trust and confidence in a civil aviation system that has made great leaps and bounds in safety over recent decades, but in recent years has suffered from complacency and a desperate drive for profits that has placed the needs of Wall Street and the balance sheet above all else. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that. And again, we will have Senator Moran if he wants to put a statement in the record. Now, Captain Murray, welcome. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I ask my written and oral testimony be submitted for the record. Uh, my name is Captain Casey Murray. I'm the president of the Southwest Airlines Pilots Association. I'm a Boeing 737 captain at Southwest, and I'm proud to represent 10,235 of the best pilots in the world. For years, our pilots have been sounding the alarm about Southwest's inadequate crew scheduling technology and outdated operational processes. Unfortunately, those warnings have been summarily ignored by Southwest leaders. Our pilots were right, but SWAPA's goal in today's hearing is not to say we told you so. But right doesn't make our pilots feel any more secure. Our hearts are broken. The December 2022 meltdown was as tragic as it was historic. SWAPA's singular goal in participating in today's hearing is to help ensure it never happens again. We want to be an integral part of its rise once again to lead the industry. While it would be easy to kick our company when it's down, this is our company, and consequently our careers and our livelihoods. Swapa pilots desire what the American public deserves, a healthy company with happy employees who have the tools they need to deliver a safe, reliable product to consumers. Those who not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And Southwest has a history of repetition. Unfortunately, despite many opportunities, Southwest Airlines management did not listen to its pilots and frontline employees who saw this meltdown coming. Pilots have a unique perspective to the airline's operation. From the flight deck, we coordinate with nearly every employee group from the front line to the airline headquarters. In order to leave a safe operation, you must be present and willing to listen and collaborate with everyone on your team. What our pilots saw and have known for years is that Southwest struggles to manage nearly any disruption, regardless of the cause. Our recent history and the data shows a pattern of increasingly disruptive operational failures, misprioritization of resources, and worst of all, a hollow leveraging of our cult culture to cover up poor management decisions. As we detailed in our written testimony, there were three main causes of the December 2022 meltdown. First, Southwest leadership failed to properly prepare for Winter Storm Elliott. Second, Southwest managers failed to modernize crew management processes and related IT systems. Finally, Southwest failed to listen to the warnings of its frontline employees. Much has been made of Southwest shortcomings in IT and technology. And while that is a causal factor in this failure, that explanation alone misses the underlying issue. The, the conditions were set years ago when Southwest leaders allowed the airline to drift away from an employee-centered culture. Instead, Southwest leaders focused on making the airline the darling of the investment community while building an insulated and strictly vertical structure where decision-making authority was slowly stripped away from frontline experts with the most situational awareness. Warning signs were ignored. Poor performance was condoned. Excuses were made. Processes atrophied. Core values were forgotten. The management pitfall is called normalization of drift, and it was coined after studying the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. As a result of this normalized drift, our once great company went from Herb's legacy of personality and agility to becoming a Technocat's dream with stovepiped fiefdoms that communicated vertically with little to no horizontal integration. 
Thankfully, the accountants who got us here are no longer in charge, at least not officially. Perhaps that is a silver lining, but only if Southwest new leaders take bold action immediately. There must be clear actions, not words, and that's what's expected from us. Our hope is that, Southwest, is, is that SWAPA's data-driven testimony provides value to the airline industry, the committee, and to the public. We all want to understand how this happened and what, what must be done together to ensure that it never happens again. As Herb Kelleher famous, famously said, never rest on your laurels or you'll get a thorn in your backside. Somehow Southwest forgot this lesson along the way, and as a result, Southwest failed two million customers. We hope the committee will use this opportunity to ensure that Southwest delivers a timeline for upgrading its crew scheduling technology, improving its crew management processes, and a commitment to collaborate with frontline employees and labor to earn back their trust. Southwest used to be an airline that supported its, em its employees. It has become an airline that is supported by its employees. I'm proud to represent the pilots of SWAPA. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thank you, Captain Murray. Now we'll welcome Mr. Watterson. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, and members of the committee. I'm Andrew Watterson, and I'm the privileged to serve as the Chief Operating Officer of Southwest Airlines. I know that Southwest's operational disruption during the last week of December uh, has garnered a tremendous amount of, uh, of attention, so I appreciate your opportunity to testify on behalf of the company regarding airline operations and consumer protections. I want to sincerely and humbly apologize to those impacted by the disruption. It caused a tremendous amount of anguish, inconvenience, and missed opportunities for our customers and our employees. During a time of year when people want to gather with their families and avoid stressful situations. We understand that for many, this is perhaps the most important trip they take all year. And again, on behalf of Southwest Airlines, I'm deeply sorry. Still, we've been mindful that an apology alone, no matter how heartfelt or how often stated, uh, would not uh, suffice. We immediately recognized we had to take care of our customers, and with regards to disruption, we did so in a variety of ways. Allowing customers to rebook their travel at no cost, effectively doubling our normal time for rebooking, granting all reasonable reimbursement requests for our customers' out-of-pocket expenses, including hotels, rental cars, meals, tickets on other airlines, and other necessary expenses like replacement car seats and strollers and pet sitting services. We promptly uh, processed refunds requested by customers for unused airfare for any Southwest flight canceled or severely disrupted during this period. We prioritized returning the bags to their, their proper owners. I'm pleased to report that except for a small percentage of recent requests, we've completed all those steps. It has truly been an all hands on deck effort and our people will not let up until the requests are completed. We also made an additional gesture of goodwill, 25,000 rapid war points, roughly a $300 value to every customer significantly impacted by the disruption. So why did this happen? Let me be clear, we messed up. And I would like to explain to you how we messed up. In hindsight, we did not have enough winter operations resiliency. From where and how we de-ice aircraft, to the cold resistance of, of our ground support equipment and infrastructure. Our high rates of cancellation in Denver and Chicago, where 25% of our flight crews are based, cause our crews to be displaced. At this point, the disruption changed from a weather event that all airlines experienced to a crew event that was unique to us. And once again, when I say crew event, it's nothing to do with the behavior of our employees, it's to do with how we manage the crew network. As the storm moved east, other Southwest airports of all sizes in the central and eastern part of the country began experiencing similar uh, operational disruptions and the cascade of challenges led to waves of cancellations within two hours of departure. This overwhelmed our crew scheduling processes and technology. We had upgraded this system earlier in the year, but we were taking a fresh look at it and other systems of how we should improve. Ultimately, none of this is an excuse. We need to make sure our operational resiliency and technology are strengthened for future extreme weather events, no matter how unprecedented. We owe that to our customers and to our employees. To that end, we've moved swiftly to make our systems more resilient and reduce the risk of further disruptions. We prioritize enhancements to our crew scheduling software. We strengthen our early indicators dashboard to escalate operational issues earlier. And we establish supplemental operational staffing that can quickly mobilize to support crew recovery efforts. And we implemented organizational changes designed to improve coordination among key divisions. We also are already several weeks underway on improving our structural capabilities around our winter operations. 
Finally, Southwest has taken additional steps to more thoroughly analyze the disruption and understand how the accumulation of events led us to the end result, from internal department reviews to engagement by our board of directors and commissioning a rigorous third party assessment. Based on all of this work, we will then reassess our, our current plans and make any necessary changes. We will invest what's needed to execute that plan in a timely and efficient manner. Let me conclude by reiterating that Southwest believes in building lasting relationships with the communities we serve. We are intensely focused on reducing the risk of repeating the operational disruption we had in December and repairing the trust of our companies had and earned over a 52 year history. I will certainly follow up with your constituents chair when I return to Dallas and I thank you. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Pinkerton. Thank you, Chair Cantwell, Ranking Member Cruz, for inviting A4A to be a part of this discussion today. As we begin, I want to give a shout out to airline employees who have done remarkable work in getting our customers safely to their destinations throughout the pandemic and during the recovery. I also want to express our sincere appreciation to the committee for your leadership in working with us and our labor partners on the payroll support program. As you know, PSP funds were critical to keeping tens of thousands of employees on the job during the most challenging time in the history of aviation. It's not an overstatement to say that PSP was the only thing standing between some carriers and bankruptcy. During those difficult days of the pandemic, we continuously said that restarting our industry would be as challenging, if not more challenging, than the rescue. The good news is that air travel rebounded faster than anyone could have predicted, but that came with growing pains. Air carriers, though, quickly took action to address issues within their control. I'll talk more about that later. But the first thing I want to do is address our commitment to our customers. Simply put, airlines want their passengers to be repeat customers. They compete fiercely on customer service. That's why U.S. airlines not only comply with legal requirements, but they go above and beyond. On customer service issues, we put our money where our mouth is. I'll give you an example. Since the pandemic, U.S. passenger carriers have issued more than $32 billion in cash refunds. That's an average of $900 million a month, in addition to other forms of compensation. And that's why refund complaints last year dropped significantly and were under 0.01%. Along those lines, we have absolutely no incentive to delay or cancel flights. Safety is our top priority. If it's not safe to fly, our planes won't take off which gets me back to the factors for the operational challenges in 2022. At the beginning of 2022, you may remember, Omicron created unpredictable staffing and absenteeism challenges for both the FAA and airlines. The entire system last year experienced extreme weather, thunderstorms, flooding, not to mention hurricanes, Ian and Nicole, and a bomb cyclone. It's not surprising then for that the first 11 months of 2022, which are the months that DOT has published, two thirds of US airline flight cancellations were caused by extreme weather at 56% and the NAS, National Aviation System, at 10% collectively. In other words, 66% of the cancellations were out of the carrier's control. But that said, carriers take responsibility for the 34% of the cancellations that were within their control and they've taken decisive actions to address those issues. What did they do? They reduced their schedules by 15%. They've been on a hiring bench. We hired over 50,000 employees last year. We're at an all-time high record over the last 20 years. Our growth rate has been two to three times the job growth rate broadly in the United States, and those are airline jobs that pay on average 20, 37% more than the average private sector job. Now, there have been lessons learned from the pandemic. Like most other, airline, or most other industries, airlines had to change their staffing models. Several airlines indicate they need 5 to 15% more staff to deliver a smaller schedule. While training and onboarding takes time, carriers are creating larger reserves, we're creating schedule buffers, and we're investing record amounts in technology to ensure resiliency. It's well documented that the FAA is also facing staffing challenges, and as we saw last month, FAA is working with antiquated technology. On the staffing side, NACA has been saying for years that there's a controller staffing shortage. We support 2023 omnibus language that creates a process by which FAA and NACA 
are working together to identify which facilities are short-staffed. Follow-up on that is needed. FAA's technology issues came into the national spotlight last month when the NOTAM outage caused a nationwide ground stop, the first since 9-11. What didn't receive as much attention were um, earlier in the month when technology issues in Miami resulted in a day's worth of long delays for anyone traveling in and out of Florida. I'm not placing blame or pointing fingers. What industry is saying is that FAA needs sufficient and stable resources to update their technology along with accountability. We're pleased Secretary Buttigieg believes, like we all do, in the need to invest in the future and in infrastructure. That infrastructure must include personnel and technology. In closing, carriers are doubling down on our efforts to improve our operational performance. But ensuring operational reliability is the most critical action airlines and government can take together for a better customer experience. Airlines are investing record amounts in their people, their technology, and tools to support operations and customers. It's paying off. We saw strong operational performance for the industry as a whole in the last five months of 2022 and the first month of 2023, and we expect that to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll turn to our now, our last witness, Dr. Clifford Winston, who's going to join us remotely. Dr. Winston. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So um, in my written testimony, what I provided was a summary of academic research on the state of airline competition, uh, the desirability of re-regulation or regulatory reform, and recommendations of policies that would improve the performance of the airline industry. And in a nutshell, what I basically argued was that the strength of uh, airline competition is, is quite strong, there's good strength there, but I could not really identify a re-regulatory or new regulatory policy that I thought would be helpful to consumer welfare, but I could recommend some policies that had a basis in markets that could greatly help uh, travelers as well as even carriers, okay? So that's really what I'm talking about. What I'll do in the oral presentation is I'll talk about a key methodological point uh, in my, summer, in my uh, testimony, and that's the idea of a counterfactual analysis, and then the substantive policy point, and that's the idea of policy experiments. Uh, this may, may sound a bit academic, but I assure I'll, I'll make this conversational for you. Okay, let me begin with the idea of a counterfactual. A counterfactual is the type of analysis that has to be taken to assess any policy, even mine. Any recommendations today, anything I'm going to recommend, you really have to run through a counterfactual. And what that is, is an understanding of the world with the policy and the world without the policy. All right. The ideal counterfactual is something that you see probably every year at Christmas time, or you've at least seen it once. And that's the film, It's a Wonderful Life. What you see is a counterfactual for a human being. They get to see what life would be like if they were never born and compare that with the life that they're currently leaving now, leading now. And there are problems with this current life, but you learn that the world would be a lot worse off if the person were never born. Now, we can't run uh, Hollywood-type counterfactuals for policy, so what have we done in airlines? Well, to justify the case for deregulation, what we did was we compared fares and intrastate flights, which were unregulated in California and Texas, with fares in interstate flights, like Boston to Washington. Those are regulated by the CAB. And what we found is that the unregulated fares in this counterfactual were substantially lower than the regulated fares. And Congress was impressed by that uh, finding and that helped lead to deregulation. When we were in deregulation, how did we assess whether it was a good policy? What we did was project up what regulated fares would be based on the CIFO, which is what the CAB used to determine regulated fares and compared them with actual deregulated fares. And again, saw a big difference between the lower deregulated fares and the CAB, what they would have been regulated fares. And in fairness to Southwest, they really deserve the lion's share of the credit of the benefits from deregulation. Now, the main point of all of this is I can't give you a counterfactual how re-regulation or new regulations would help. 
If I spin through it, I'm going to point out other things that are going to lead to costs. They're going to offset what you see as benefits. Okay, so what can we do? Let me give you a different counterfactual. Imagine the automobile industry, and it does not allow foreign cars to be made or sold in the U.S. No Toyota, no Honda, no Maserati, whatever, right? Make it worse. There are no private dealers. There's only public dealers. And in major metropolitan areas like Minneapolis, um, Denver, Atlanta, there's only one. Now, this obviously is not a desirable state for the automobile industry, but I've just described the U.S. airline industry. There is no foreign competition in the U.S. markets. All airports are public, and some places only have one. So what I'm suggesting is allow cabotage, that is allow foreign carriers to serve domestic routes, privatize the airports where they have a vested interest in helping consumers. And I'll add on, privatizing air traffic control is in many ways having the same effects of increasing competition, okay? Now, is my final point, let me raise the policy experiment. You'll hear this and say, this is too much. You know, we can't let every carrier in this country, we can't privatize every airport. Fine, let's do experiments. Let's do this for North America in terms of cabotage. Allow Canadian, Mexican, US airlines to serve all routes in these countries. In terms of airports, we don't privatize all, but let's privatize airports in major metropolitan areas when there are at least three. New York, San Francisco, LA, Washington. Let those airports compete. Can they work with airlines to make passengers better off? Reducing congestion, putting in heated runways where appropriate to melt snow and ice, make things safer, and even try to work out a way to provide low cost accommodations. This is the idea. So I would say in summing up, Southwest did not make mistakes. DOT did not make mistakes. Congress does not make mistakes. People make mistakes. If you wanna reduce the likelihood of mistakes and you want people to be able to correct their mistakes, they need to be held accountable. More competition will enable that to happen. And I hope you proceed with considering these policies. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll now turn to questions, five minute rounds, and I ask my colleagues if you can stick to five minute rounds only because we are expecting a vote at 11 o'clock and also a uh, uh, briefing in the Capitol on the Chinese balloon situation that I know many members are gonna want to attend. So hopefully we can get in through as many questions as possible. And depending on the interest of the committee, we will adjourn for a time period and come back to allow members if we haven't finished up uh, with their questions. But uh, I also wanna say, uh, this committee is gonna make FAA reauthorization a very big priority. So today, I guess, is a kind of a kickoff, if you will, not intended thus, but uh, you, many of the witnesses have brought up several issues that will, I think, attract more attention from us in our discussion period uh, about this. And we are having a NOTAM hearing with the FAA, I think, next week. So we will continue the operational issues into the future, for sure. Um, but I wanted to start with that, because I think the issue of operational control is very important. Mr. Watterson, you now plan to upgrade your uh, system. I and mean, one of the things about Southwest, again, is that point-to-point -point service that had more of a problem dealing with the weather event as opposed to a hub model. When are you going to complete that upgrade? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, the upgrade to the cruise system I talked about? The dispatch, the flight dispatch system. Um, so, um, Please correct me if I'm, I'm not getting your question correct, but uh, we um, are spending $1.3 billion in, in technology this year, which is about 25% more than 2019. Um, and uh, that was, again, 9% more than, than 2018. So we're, we're moving our spending up faster than our revenue and our size, and we're upgrading a number of systems with that. With regards to this event, our crew scheduling software had a particular uh, fault. It didn't stop working, but uh, we lost, uh, it fell down, so to speak, and overwhelmed. There's a specific- I, I don't think on my I constituents' apologize. point, I don't think they care about what, whether it was, didn't go to full capacity, had a glitch. They wanna know if you're going to fix that system and when. Uh, yes, uh, yes, Senator. Uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, the reflex will go in and it'll be live in our production system. It's already had two rounds in our test system. So that the same event, if it happened 
in a week, we would have a different outcome. That technology would not stop functioning. As I mentioned in my testimony, we believe our winter operations resiliency was the root cause, and that'll take longer to address. And so we will focus on that for the bulk of our time. Okay. You're here today, and I very much appreciate it. Yes, Your CEO didn't want to show up. <clears throat> now, we could have figured out a way to get him here, but you're the operations guy. And I thought, you know what? I really want to talk to him. So I really want to understand, because I have a lot of pilots here, and they're telling me that they've been telling you about this for a long, long time. And so what I want to know, because a lot of people suffered a lot because of this, juxtaposed to other airlines and where they were, and you just paid out a huge dividend. So people want to know, are these guys going to invest in the technology that will make this system operational so this will never happen again? Thank you, Senator. We need to invest in technology, but also in our uh, operational systems outside of technology uh, because the winter operations uh, were too much for us. You're correct that other airlines uh, were able to handle the winter weather and we were not. And so to be able to uh, better handle the winter weather, we need more infrastructure at airports for de-icing. We need more de-icing trucks. We need new technology systems with de-icing. We need to weatherize our ground support equipment. So there's lots of work and lots of expenditures we expect to prevent this from happening again. And that will be the bulk of the effort. And so what is the cost of that upgrade that you need to do, and when will it be completed? Uh, we're undergoing the assessment right now. We are doing a top-to-bottom view of our winter operations, and uh, the undoubtedly be in the millions and millions of dollars, but it won't be until probably in, in March we'll have finished the assessment of exactly how much and where. We already know in Denver and Midway we need substantial upgrades, and we're already uh, pursuing that with the airports. Do you understand the public's frustration with this? Do you understand that they want to know, and we're going to get into a lot of technology issues, trust me, um, but I think they want to know that you're going, your brand, yes, has been built. And uh, I definitely think Herb Kelleher would be here if he was the CEO. He would have been here today because that's, that's Herb. I actually sat with him on the Roatan Commission, so got to know a lot about his views on aviation. I think Mr. Murray, Captain Murray, is going to say that you lost operational control. And that is the FAA's oversight to make sure that you have operational control. So if you don't make the technology investment to keep up that operational control, then yes, we should say something about that. Now, Captain Murray, did Southwest Airlines lose operational control in the aftermath of the weather event? Uh, my answer is yes. I, I think the written testimony uh, provides a lot of data and, 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 and tells the story of how it did. Uh, Mr. Watterson's own written testimony, uh, fourth paragraph under why did this happen, he actually says, we could not execute the plan we had established for operating during the storm. And, and I believe that answers your question as well. What do you think it takes to get this system changed and upgraded so that if we have another massive weather event, that the point-to-point -point system that is unique to Southwest doesn't have the same kind of uh, delays and outages? Well, I, I think it's gonna take a much more holistic approach to, to operating our network. Um, we love our network. We think it's, it's the magic behind Southwest. That's not our issue. Our issue is, is when there is a disruption, then Southwest, it takes Southwest much longer to recover. And it's more for us, it's a process and how they program that IT and how they connect pilots to airplanes and flight attendants, um, which is what causes the, the ongoing execution problems. So that is something that can be done relatively quickly. They have to change any pilot who is here, and, and, and these pilots have come here on their day off, uh, can attest to the chaos that um, they go through when going to work. They don't know where they're gonna go. They don't know where they're gonna overnight. They don't know how long they're gonna be on duty, and they don't know how long their overnight's gonna be. I'm, so it's holistic. Thanks, uh, my time has expired, but I will point out Ms. Pinkerton's point about the overstaffing and scheduling. We're gonna see when we look at this whole system and we have the, all the airlines, we're gonna find out that the people who overstaffed had enough people to survive this the best. And the Southwest ended up on the other end because of this technology and the point-to-point -point system. But anyway, Senator Cruz. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to each of the witnesses, and, and thank you also. There are many pilots and, and individuals who are here for this hearing, and I know many of you are Texans, and so welcome to Washington. We're glad to have you here. Um, Captain Murray, let me return to what you and, and Chair Cantwell were just discussing. In, in the view of the Southwest pilots, what caused 16,000 flights to be canceled, and what needs to be done to prevent that from happening again? Well. Thank you, Ranking Member Cruz. Um, um, again, it, it, was a, it was a cascade of events um, that ultimately uh, caused, you know, the failure in IT, the failure in its ability to keep up, the, the, the loss of where pilots, where airplanes, and where crews were, um, a failure of infrastructure. Um, our, our operations agents who, who, who have a front row to our, to our customers and board our airplanes weren't sure what was going on, nor could get answers. So it, 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 was, it was a failure, epically, from, from top to bottom. Uh, we had crews that were on the phone, we have screenshots, 17 hours on the phone trying to get a hold of someone. Um, many of our frontline employees went above and beyond and were able to cobble together a crew, cobble together an airplane, get passengers, and they did that on their own. And, and so when I said in my my oral testimony that you know they, they rely and, and they've continued to rely more and more on uh, being supported by their employees. The employees are the ones that did, did the Herculean task of, of kind of trying to recover. So in your testimony, you expressed frustration uh, that, that in your view, management was not listening to the concerns of the pilots. Uh, could, could you elaborate on that frustration and do you feel that the changes that are needed are, are being implemented now? Well, um, so uh, the pilots have been uh, sounding the alarm bells for, for over a decade. Uh, we've been the whistleblowers on, on this. We've watched this progress and seen these meltdowns occur. I've laid it out in my written testimony for you. Um, we've seen these meltdowns occur with more frequency and more severity. We have tried to get them. We love our airline, um, and they have to be better. And, and we are trying to partner with them and, and I think that's key. The frontline operators, whether it's a baggage cart, uh, whether it's a fueling truck, whether it's a pilot, whether it's a flight attendant, whether it's a customer service agent, all have frontline experience in seeing what goes on. Um, and, and there has to be a partnering. Um, we are a very data-driven organization at SWAPA. Uh, we have provided them point-to-point -point solutions for their point-to-point -point network. Um, so I, I, I think there has to be, this isn't an IT fix, this isn't a plug and play. Again, it's got to be holistic and it's got to be addressed and it can be addressed tomorrow in a process. And, and to clarify, your, your criticism is not with the point to point model. Southwest is unusual. Most other airlines have a hub and spoke model, whereas Southwest has a point to point model. You're, 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 and some members of this committee have raised Concerns with the point-to-point -point model, I will say as a customer, I, I actually find it very convenient, and it's, there's a reason I'm on a Southwest flight just about every week of the year, but, but your concern is not with the point-to-point -point model, is that Absolutely correct? Absolutely not. Uh, I, I do believe that if you look at Southwest Airlines history in comparison to the rest of the industry, uh, since our existence, uh, we have made money every year except during 2020. Uh, the rest of the airlines have not. And, and I believe that is the magic of our point-to-point -point system. I think our customers love it. I believe it gives us a competitive edge. More importantly, during downtimes, it provides some flexibility and some agility to take advantage of, of times. Herb Kelleher has a famous quote of, that we've predicted um, 12 out of the last five recessions. And, uh, and, 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 he, and it was our point-to-point -point network that uh, provided for that. Uh, Dr. Winston. Some of the proposals that have been discussed uh, by Democrats on this committee and indeed by President Biden in the State of the Union address involve the government regulating things like pricing, things like uh, fees that, that customers are paying, regulating things unrelated to safety. And let me be clear, I think it is an integral responsibility of the government, the FAA, to focus on safety and ensure safety for the flying public. Uh, and I can understand the appeal of, of saying to people, you don't want to pay this fee or that fee. I, I could understand the appeal of saying that every air, airline must have only first class seats and a free foot massage with every flight. And that would make flying quite comfortable. 
but it would also predictably drive up the cost of air travel and price many Americans out of the market of being able to travel for work or leisure. So, Dr. Winston, what would the effect be of the regulations being discussed for the flying public, and, and would consumers be better off or worse off with the federal government regulating pricing and fees and other aspects of airline travel unrelated to safety? Thank you. So uh, I think the, the important thing here, we need to be specific and we want to work with the counterfactual. So we don't, it's, it's a little hard to understand if we go very general saying a regulation. I want to know what regulation are we talking about? And then we just spin through, okay, what is going to be the full effect of that regulation? So I'll, I'll mention one. You know, suppose we say that um, all check luggage is free. You know, we have to allow people to be able to check luggage and not charge them. And, you know, on, on the face of it, that sounds a good thing. People want to check their luggage. They don't want to pay extra fees, but then spin through what's going to happen. Well, airlines are going to incur a cost from that. Um, this is, and this is all airlines, not just Southwest. And this is a competitive industry. And they're gonna, they can't incur these costs. They, they have to pass them on and they will with higher fares. And we can continue to do this exercise with pretty much anything that I've heard thus far recommended. Now, people complain about transparency. That's a different issue. I mean, certainly airlines, and I don't really know why these, why companies do this, can say, look, here's the full, here's the price and quote, does not include in bold letters, extras. Put an asterisk and say, here are the extras. So people know they have to pay for baggage uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's in general what we can expect to see and we can plug in specific policies. Am I allowed to say something else? Uh, well, if it's really very short, because we're over this time and we need to get to various members. Okay, very short. All airlines run point to point. The only flights that are not point to point are those that crash. Southwest really does not run that different a network than other airlines. Senator, Bald Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, Mr. Watterson, you undoubtedly heard directly from the families who have been, uh, whose travel plans were disrupted by the Southwest meltdown. And um, many families from Wisconsin also reached out to me. Uh, one gentleman, Paul, wrote to me about his very expensive attempt to fly home from uh, Florida to Milwaukee with Southwest. His flight was canceled twice um, at the very last minute, and while he was waiting at the airport, uh, he had no choice uh, other than to spend an unexpected $222 to stay at a hotel. The next morning, with no good options, he spent... Uh, about $700 to rent a vehicle and drive 23 hours home. Um, yes, Paul ultimately was reimbursed by Southwest for those expenses, but he can't really be reimbursed for uh, the time and frustration of being in that unacceptable situation, which so many other travelers found themselves in because of Southwest cancellations. Um, so Mr. Watterson, as you know, Air carriers who accepted uh, payroll support program relief funding were banned from conducting stock buybacks until last year. For me, this was an essential condition uh, when we were writing the CARES Act. Um, while Southwest has not yet conducted any stock buybacks, it was the first major carrier to reinstate stock dividends to shareholders. My preference would be that you prioritize your customers the highest of all. And so do you plan on moving forward with any stock buybacks prior to ensuring that your technology is fully prepared to deal with a similar disruption in the future? Uh, thank you, Senator. And um, uh, I apologize once again for the disruption to your, uh, your constituents uh, experience. It's indeed unacceptable and we'll uh, endeavor to make our system more robust so that it does not happen again. Um, and I'm glad that they're reimbursed. To the extent you have constituents who are not reimbursed, please contact our office well, and we'll, we'll definitely follow up because uh, we want to be do right by our customers, even if they were unacceptably disserviced. 
Um, and I'm also very grateful for the Payroll Support Act and other uh, uh, follow-on bills. And we, um, we were, took pains to maintain uh, our end of the bargain, not ceasing service to any domestic airport, uh, restrictions on buybacks, dividends, and executive compensation, which we all find very appropriate. And, uh, and we're happy to abide by them. Uh, and yes, we, we did uh, recently declare a dividend. We um, uh, did that after we felt like we had uh, enough funds to properly fund both paying our employees uh, top of the industry wages, or at least accruing for them, uh, for funding, uh, giving generous benefits, funding uh, purchase of our aircraft, uh, funding for our IT department, and also um, um, uh, paying down our debt. And so essentially, we pay shareholders kind of at the end of the line after we funded everybody else. And so, yes, Senator, we will continue to fund what's necessary, and whatever comes out of this review, we will fund what's necessary um, to, uh, to achieve that. All right. Um, it's my understanding that some airports uh, that are serviced by Southwest were not receiving timely information uh, from the company's leadership uh, throughout the December uh, meltdown. Uh, this includes Mitchell International Airport in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, although Milwaukee is the only airport in Wisconsin that Southwest serves, Southwest provides about 45% of the airport service. Uh, while the airport did its best to react to the situation by securing effective pa affected passengers' bags, it had little to no information from the company about when they could expect the situation to improve. Can you commit to providing clear and improved communication with airports moving forward uh, to ensure that they're able to provide the best uh, service possible to their communities, particularly during any uh, uh, future disruptions in service. Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, we're proud to serve um, the Milwaukee area and provide them with great air service. And I commit to you that we will follow up and make sure we communicate better with airports in such situations. Thank you. Captain Murray, real quickly, uh, 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 the Southwest Airline Pilots Association, SWAPA, has been raising the alarm about Southwest's uh, technology not being equipped to deal with a major weather disruption for years, as you've uh, uh, just uh, uh, emphasized, including a podcast that was aired just before the December meltdown. Given your members' firsthand encounters with the shortcomings of the existing technology, has Southwest done enough to ensure uh, SWAPA and other workers have a seat at the table with any forthcoming technology upgrades? Well, I, I think that's 100, oh, thank you, Senator. I think that's 100% critical as we move forward. And, and, and it's gotta be, <clears throat> excuse me, it's gotta be all of labor. And, uh, and up to this point, uh, we've seen some minor touches and, and been included in, 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 in two meetings. Uh, but um, really uh, addressing our process failures uh, and, and how that's going to be programmed into our IT, the, the, the frontline operators must be involved, and, and that is something that we're insisting on, and it's something that I hope comes from, from, from this testimony today. Thank you. Senator Capitel. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the ranking member, and thank all of you for being here today. Um, I will say anecdotally in my office, uh, I, I have, we had like 10 of my staff members, I said who was affected by what happened. Uh, about four of them were affected, so I, that shows you the breadth of Southwest, I think. Uh, and they were all satisfied with the, um, well, a lot of frustrations at the time and all of that, satisfied with the remedies that Southwest brought forward to them. So I think, you know, you need, if we're going to find some good news here, I think that is a little bit of good news, at least for those. I understand it may not be universal, but at least in those four, they were. Um, so, uh, Mr. Waterston, your CEO uh, in an interview last week said that it's a misconception that technology was the issue and blamed more the storm, understanding that it's more than one thing. But I'm hearing in the testimony and response to questions and the fact that you're putting a, a large investment in technology that it is, in fact, the technology. How would you respond to that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, yes, there were uh, technology issues during the disruption, and we don't dispute that, and we will make the necessary investments there. Uh, all we're, we were trying to say is the problem or the root cause was how we handled our winter operations, and that's where we, we will see us put some focus over a multi-year period um, because uh, that's what started the dominoes falling. The last domino was the crew scheduling system uh, not being able to function as, as, as we'd like, um, but it was the upstream stuff that was the bigger problem that we're addressing. Well, I understand one of the other problems, too, was de-icing, say, in Denver, 
there was uh, not enough de-icing equipment. The plane sits out, you got to come back around, get back in line, and then you run into timing problems and other things. Is How are you addressing that de-icing in those areas that obviously Detroit, I mean, Denver, Chicago, uh, need the uh, extra equipment? And I understand that's your responsibility, really, as an airline to provide that rather than the airport? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, in general, yes, the de-icing pads. Uh, in some airports, you must de-ice in a specific location to have the fluid recaptured. That's done in conjunction with the airport. Mm -hmm. And so we are meeting with uh, Denver Airport on February 14th to discuss this and uh, following up also with Chicago as well as other airports as far as those infrastructure. But then the, the, uh, the other equipment and staffing is our responsibility. Uh, and we were definitely uh, uh, evaluating everything and making the necessary investments from top to bottom. It's not just in those areas, but also technology used in de-icing, uh, our training, our procedures. We're looking at everything uh, to see what we can do to up our game so this doesn't happen again. Yeah, I saw a lot of heads nodding there in the uh, in the pilot population on, on that question. Uh, another thing I've wondered, did, did you ever run a, a worst case scenario? I mean, certainly, you know, you always want to plan for the worst, uh, did, but did you ever run a full-out scenario where you could anticipate a bad storm, you know, de-icing de issues, so that you could have gone back to those trial runs to see how we can fix this more quickly? Uh, thank you, Senator. In, in regards to winter operations, what we look at is our throughput of how many aircraft per hour we're able to effectively de-ice in different levels of storms. And so uh, the initial plan that I referenced in my testimony was based on our previous modeling of how much uh, we could per hour uh, handle in our de-icing pads and such in Denver and Midway. Those, um, um, based on history, those proved to be incorrect for the storm. And that's why we need to uh, go back and reinvest in those areas so that we can more robustly achieve those throughput rates. All right. Well, I, I would highly recommend that. I mean, uh, that also could have pro uh, brought up, I think, more quickly your technology failures as well. Um, uh, Ms. Pinkerton, uh, we were talking about compensating uh, customers. Uh, and I know that some of my colleagues uh, are pushing for an airline consumer protection law similar to what they have in the EU. How do you think, when we see what the response of Southwest has been, would this change that or would it put, how do you think that would impact what we saw as their response? Well, as I mentioned in my opening comments, um, collectively the industry has refunded $32 billion since the pandemic. Um, and uh, I think that having a, an EU type compensation in this country would be a disaster. I mean, deregulation um, has been an enormous benefit for consumers. A disaster in that it would be more costly to the consumer? Absolutely. Or you know, it, I, you all are too young to remember this, but it used to be that only the rich could fly. <laughs> um, that's not the case anymore, um, and we'd like to keep it that way. There's no doubt that deregulation has democratized air travel, and yes, a compensation system and there have been analysis that have been done of the EU system. It just adds cost. It doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, Southwest and all of our carriers have made record investments in our technology yeah. to make it more resilient, um, to recover more quickly. 21 billion this year, we're expecting 27 billion next year. We need that money to continue to invest in our people and our product and our customers. Thank you. And I'd like to say to the, the men and women that work in the airlines, particularly the ones flying into places like West Virginia, although Southwest is not, uh, thank you for keeping us safe. Uh, we, it is with uh, great pride, I think, to, to, for us to feel when we sit down in that buckle in that we're handled with great professionals who have our safety at the top of the list. So thank you all very much for that. Senator Klobuchar. Well said, Senator Capito. Thank you. Uh, and I agree. Uh, thank you for all your good work. And thank you, uh, Chair, for having this really important hearing. Um, we all know what happened. I know that, uh, as we say in the Senate, everyone has said it, but I haven't said it. Um, but I know what happened in my state. And that is that in Minnesota, nearly 80% of Southwest's flights in and out of our Minneapolis-St. Paul airport uh, were canceled over the Christmas holiday weekend. And meanwhile, the breaking in the crew scheduling led to a lot of overworked Southwest employees uh, with little direction on how to improve the situation. Uh, we all know it's unacceptable, and I appreciate the apologies and the um, comments about the changes that are going to be made. Senator Moran and I uh, co-chair the Travel and Tourism Caucus of the Senate. We're very focused on this, as I know the chair is and many others. 
So um, I worked with Senators Moran and Capito uh, just recently to introduce the NOTAM Improvement Act, uh, which uh, is a simple beginning to all this with a task force to recommend improvements to prevent uh, future outages. Representative Stauber from Minnesota carrying it in the House. It actually already passed the House, and I know there's going to be many other ideas. I know that Senators Duckworth, Thune, Moran, Fisher, and Kelly and myself are working on a bill to expand the FAA's workforce development, uh, which is also a key part of this, both at the FAA and the private uh, airlines. So, Captain Murray, in your testimony, you highlight how in November you warned about risks associated with the crew scheduling and IT uh, systems. Why do you think your warnings were ignored? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, th that podcast um, um, w was one of of many warnings that we had we had relayed to Southwest, uh, either publicly, uh, privately, um, and and we've been trying, as as I testified a little bit earlier. You know, we've tried to offer solutions uh, where we see breakdowns, um, and so w we've gotten very little traction in in that regard. Um, and so as we have, have moved forward, we have, we have been expressing some very dire warnings about how, okay. how brittle. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to you, uh, Mr. Waterston. Uh, Southwest recently announced $1.3 billion investment to update the technology. Is that going to get at the issues that Captain Murray raised? How is the money going to be spent? Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, the $1.3 billion is a 25% increase over to, uh, 2019 pre-pandemic levels, so we're increasing our IT spend obviously faster than our company is growing, um, and we're going to use that across the, the operation, uh, both in the, in the crew scheduling area, but also in our ground operations and, and flight operations area so that we can make sure that we have modernized our operation. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Pinkerton. In addition to the operational challenges this winter, uh, there were also disruptions during the spring and summer of 20. 22, part of it was post-COVID uh, travel demand. What changes did airlines implement to correct the operational challenges they faced during this time period? You're, you're absolutely right. Um, carriers uh, did learn lessons post-pandemic. We had to change our staffing models um, as a result of people being sick, increased absenteeism. The two most important things we did, we reduced our schedules by 15% in 2022. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, we went on a hiring bench. We hired 50,000 people in 2022. Um, and, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, carriers have identified the fact that they need 5 to 15% more staff to fly a, a smaller schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Watterson, different subject, uh, customer service. Um, Senator Baldwin, I heard, asked some questions about it. Um, could you talk about what steps you've taken to improve customer service and communication uh, with passengers? Um, Senator Capito got it clearly some of the remedies. Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, we've uh, uh, implemented uh, improved ways for customers to inquire with us about refunds, uh, baggage return, uh, and the like. And we've also uh, made sure that we stayed well within the DOT uh, guidelines for how we re reimburse and uh, refund customers who've, ha who've had uh, disruptions. We pride ourselves on having high net promoter scores, so we're making sure we have increased staff, increased investment to be able to respond to our customers when they contact us. Okay, very good. I think you know how important I believe it is to have competitive airlines and have more competition. Um, so I'm with you, hoping that um, uh, this is all going to work and that you get at some of these cyber issues, because we can't uh, have um, no competition in the airline. And you're clearly, as we all know, and your employees are uh, one of the key competitors for people to get affordable. And I would put a pitch in for Sun Country Airlines of Minnesota as well on that front. Ms. Pinkerton, um, I mentioned this legislation um, to get Rex to strengthen the resiliency and the cybersecurity of the NOTAM system. In your view, how can we make sure something like this doesn't happen again? Uh, it's it's uh, a great question. I think that, um, thank you for the, for the legislation. I think that's a great first step. Um, I will say that I think um, that that's just the tip of the iceberg at the FAA. Right. And their, their capital budget has been stagnant for 14 years. Um, so I think we're going to see more and more. Yeah, the program's 30 years old. Um, their, their facilities are 50 years old. 
Um, I think this issue requires leadership from the White House, OMB, DOT, FAA, and then Congress supporting uh, an ask for additional resources, frankly, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and accountability, and accountability. Right, and uh, as well, I'm out of my time here, and maybe I'll ask you a question on the record later, but just about the investment on the private side as well. It goes together. I think. It absolutely does. That's something we need to do together. We had record $21 billion worth of investment in technology this year, and we're predicting forecasting $27 billion next year compared to the $2.9 billion that the FAA is doing. For 5% of the GDP is what we support. So that's okay. an important investment. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Senator all Vance. You. Thank you. Senator Vance. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Thanks for everybody for your time. But I, I want to start actually just asking, maybe following up a little bit on what Senator Klobuchar talked about um, in, in some of the antitrust questions. So I'd like to direct this to Mr. Hudson and then, and then to Ms. Pinkerton, because I'd like to get you know, both sides' perspective here. Um, you know, there's been a lot of argument that the, you know, if you look at margins in the airline industry, if you look at certain geographic routes, if you look at certain practices, that there's some evidence of consolidation and consolidation in a way that's very anti-competitive and, and, and not in the best interest of consumers. Uh, I'd love to get your reaction to that. Um, what do you think the evidence is for consolidation? What do you think the evidence against it is? Because uh, I'd like to understand, you know, frankly, what's going on. Thank you, Senator. Um, if we can look back at the history of 45 years since the Deregulation Act, what we see is Originally, there's a great profusion of, of new airlines that come into the system. It, it then it causes instability, and many of the older ones go bankrupt, and there's consolidation. We now have a, a system which essentially four airlines control over 80% of all the domestic flights. They essentially have an oligopoly. And the, the way we think you have to deal with that is have reasonable regulation as well as um, competition. I, I'd like to quote uh, two people who are really authorities in this who couldn't be here today. Um, one, Alfred Kahn, is a former chairman of the CAB and considered the father of airline deregulation. He said this about 25 years ago when the problems were really raising that we have today. These problems drive home the lesson that the dismantling of comprehensive regulation should not be understood as synonymous with total government laissez-faire. The principal policy failures over the past 15 years have been failures on the part of government to vigorously and imaginatively fulfill responsibilities that we, in, he's talking about himself really, in deregulating the industry never intended to abdicate. One other person I would Ms. mention Pinkerton, so, is... Sorry, sir, because I, I, of the limited time. Um, th thank you, but Ms. Pinkerton would love to get your thoughts, too. Absolutely. I'll give you the evidence. And I think the first um, piece of data, again, is airfares, which are the fares and the ancillary fees in the last 40 years, have dropped 55%. Flying used to be for the rich. It's not anymore. We want to keep it that way. Deregulation has democratized air travel. It's critical that we not turn the, the clock back on that. In terms of consolidation, don't forget there were a lot of bankruptcies after 9-11, and there were consolidation after that. But what has it produced? It's produced uh, uh, an industry where we have fierce competition, we have low-cost carriers, we have ultra-low-cost carriers, and we have global network carriers. A lot of people like to make the global network carriers out to be the bad boogeyman. Um, the fierce competition from the low-cost carriers and the lower-cost carriers means they're carrying 50% of the market today. Global network carriers have lost market share. It's gone from 72% 20 years ago to 51% today. So I think the evidence is in, is in the data. It's, a, it's the, the customer service and airfares and the variety of airlines that are out there. 11 air, we just had two new airlines get into this industry, Breeze and Avello, um, plus the other 11 airlines that are out there competing fiercely every day. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, both. And uh, directly this last question to Mr. Watterson, just because th th this may have a, a policy implication and it may not, but how often do you get to talk to one of the senior executives of America's Airlines uh, or one of America's biggest airlines? And so, you know, I I've heard this from constituents many times. I've experienced this myself. You know, you, you go to the gate, 
and uh, your flight's supposed to leave in 20 minutes. And yet the flight that's supposed to take you to where it's supposed to go has not even arrived. And of course, it has to deplane and all that stuff. And then, you know, it's supposed to leave in 10 minutes. And then you go and ask the gate agent, is the flight going to leave on time? And they say, yeah, even though the flight hasn't arrived yet. And then an hour and a half later is when your flight actually departs. I mean, that's a pretty common experience, I think, for a lot of travelers across a number of airlines. I'm just curious why you guys do that. Uh, is there a business practice that motivates that decision? Because it seems like it's pretty obvious to everybody the flight's not going to leave on time, but there isn't always transparency about that fact. Uh, thank you, Senator, and I apologize if you experienced that on Southwest Airlines. Um, the, the situation we often find ourselves in is more uh, smaller times, uh, not an hour and a half, but usually when the flights are maybe plus or minus 15 minutes, um, we're, uh, we have two choices. Be super transparent, and the time could go plus or minus five or 10 minutes every five or 10 minutes, or stick with the original time knowing that you're kind of a little bit off. And so a lot of times we have customer confusion. It's that debate of like how frequently you do update them, knowing that time will change frequently, or do you just stick with the original time even if it be off a little bit? So there's probably not a very good answer uh, in the end of which way to go. Thank you. Senator Markey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, during the first 11 months of 2022, more than 25% of Southwest flights either arrived late or were canceled. Southwest's worst performance since 2014. Southwest pilots have been sounding the alarm about these operational issues for years, yet these warnings were apparently summarily ignored. Mr. Waterston, did the Southwest Airline Pilots Association warn Southwest about the issues that led to the meltdown, yes or no? Thank you, Senator. They warned us about some of the issues that were part of the meltdown. Okay, and why didn't you do anything about it? Uh, thank you, Senator. We were uh, addressing part of those issues. Obviously, it was uh, unsuccessful, but with regard to some of the crew scheduling, we had invested in those areas. Well, um, again, because you did not listen to those warnings, uh, catastrophic conditions were created for passengers by the hundreds of thousands all across our country. Um, so um, that is absolutely unacceptable. You were warned. Um, that mismanagement absolutely uh, led to um, real pain, real harm for families. Uh, in response um, to what happened, Senator Blumenthal and I called on Southwest to provide a cash hardship payment beyond refunds and reimbursements to help compensate for passenger suffering. Instead, Southwest gave each passenger frequent flyer miles. Mr. Waterston, will Southwest commit to providing customers with a cash hardship payment instead of frequent flyer points if passengers desire that. Uh, thank you, Senator. We believe being generous with the reimbursements and giving uh, frequent flyer points is uh, a preferable way to uh, compensate our customers. Well, um, unfortunately for those uh, customers, um, those points are little consolation uh, for passengers like Christine Pastor and her husband who were unable to visit their sick daughter at the hospital on her birthday over the holidays because of Southwest cancellations. Mr. Waterston, if an impacted passenger refuses to fly Southwest again, will Southwest commit to providing the passenger with a cash payment instead of the frequent flyer points? Yes or no? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, I think we have plenty of opportunities for them to fly us. If they choose to fly somebody else, um, uh, certainly their choice. It is their choice. Would you give them a cash payment in order for them to fly on another uh, carrier rather than Southwest? Uh, no, Senator, we will not pay them cash to pay on another airline unless it's for reimbursement of a flight they took in the disruption. And again, that just misses the whole point about the customers, um, how they were inconvenienced, and how they need to be compensated with cash. Um, it's deeply um, disappointing to us for many passengers um, the, um, the point system that you want to use is just going to be uh, useless. It's nothing but an empty gesture. And I will say that uh, 14 of the senators uh, wrote you a letter asking you to answer questions on this and get the answers back by February 2nd. It's now February 9th. Um, obviously, uh, your answers could have helped us to prepare for this hearing. Uh, and it's unacceptable that Southwest did not respond to the Congress in time so that we could be fully prepared for this hearing. Ms. Pinkerton, in your testimony, 
you write that 66 percent of flight cancellations between January and November last year were caused by weather or the national aviation system. Here's another way to look at that data. More than one-third of cancellations were the airline's own fault, such as maintenance or staffing issues. Uh, Ms. Pinkerton, what percentage of flights were canceled in 2019 due to the airline's own operational problems? Senator, I don't have that data at my fingertips, but what I did earlier was say that we take responsibility when cancellations are within our control. We acted very quickly in 2022. We did two things. We reduced our schedule by 50%, and we went on a hiring binge. We hired 50,000 people in 2022. All right. Well, the answer is um, 28%, far less than the 35% last year that is due to the airline's own operational problems. And in 2018, uh, it was under 25%. And in 2017, that figure was below 23%. So again, this number just keeps rising year after year. There is a serious problem. In total, the airlines caused 53,000 cancellations in the first 11 months of 2022, more than double than before the, pan the pandemic. Airlines also caused over 33 million minutes in flight delays during that period, up 65% over pre-pandemic figures. Uh, that data tells a clear and obvious story. Airlines failed travelers last year over and over. Passengers missed birthdays and weddings. And Congress needs to put guardrails on the industry to stop this putting of profits over people. And we also need to pass my Fair Fees Act so airlines stop nickel and diming customers for basic airline services, including my Families Fly Together Act, which I'm reintroducing again today to prevent airlines from charging fees just so a mom can sit with a five-year-old daughter on a plane. Senator. It is absolutely unacceptable that that airlines charge for that service. I have to make clear, none of the A4A carriers uh, charge a family seating fee. Um, there are a couple of carriers that, that do, um, so, but that's not targeted at us. But I also want to say, just on the whole ancillary fee issue, because I know it's a passion of yours, um, I wanted you to know ancillary fees have actually um, been reduced over the last several years. In fact, change fees are now a third of what they used to be. Um, okay, so Ms. Pinkerton, I, I, we have to get on to other people. This is an important issue, and I guarantee you we'll get into a much heavier debate, but I, I, accountability isn't re-regulation, and I think we'll have a lot of conversation about how to grow the airline industry and how to protect consumers. So, ten, Can I just say 10 seconds? 10 seconds. It's, customers just feel like they're shaken upside down at the counter for all these additional charge fees. It just has to end. Thank you. Senator Duckworth, I'm turning the gavel over to you. I hope you will call on Senators Bud and yourself and Senator Schmidt and then recess us until... Uh, after the secure briefing. We're going to take inventory to make sure that people uh, do want to come back and ask further questions, but we'll take account of that. But anyway, I'm turning the gavel over to you to call on uh, Senator Budd is next. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Senator Budd. Thank you, Chair, and I thank the members of the panel for, uh, for being here today. So, Mr. Watterson, Southwest uh, December failure disrupted the Christmas plans of tens of thousands of Americans, as we all know. Families were unable to gather. People were left stranded. Uh, luggage was shipped all over the country, separating from their people, and, uh, from their possessions, and sometimes even from their vital medications and their appointments. Uh, now, you've had to answer a lot today, uh, but for the sake of the folks I represent back in North Carolina, I'd like to hear your answers to a few questions. So what steps are your airline taking to make sure that you are ready for the next busy travel season and also to deal with inclement weather? Uh, thank you, Senator. Our, our plan involves uh, uh, three buckets of actions. Uh, the first bucket is immediate short-term actions we uh, implemented just after the, uh, the disruption so that this exact similar type of uh, activity with regards to some of our crew scheduling software and some of our uh, decision-making were remediated. Uh, we have a second bucket, which is each operational department is going back and revisiting uh, the disruption and understanding what they and those departments could do better. That could be engine covers and engines, you know, de-icing trucks, things of that nature in each department. And then thirdly, we have a systemic review 
issues uh, done at the company level, we understand how all the dominoes in sequence led to that last domino. And so that third one will be bigger changes that we must fund over the balance of this year so that by the next winter season, uh, we are ready. Thank you for that. So in 2022, I understand that your operating revenues were around uh, just shy of 24 billion dollars and Southwest spends about a billion dollars on technology every year and understand that you plan to spend 1.3 billion in fiscal year 2023 on technology upgrades right so far yes sir. yes sir that's correct okay great so is roughly spending the same amount of money on this issue going to fix what went wrong back in December so here's the question behind the question is it really a technology problem or is it a management problem uh, thank you, Senator. We have uh, technology needs that need to be addressed, so we will spend incremental to that $1.3 billion if necessary if we find that there's technology that requires addition that's not already funded. Uh, number two, I, I mentioned earlier that the, um, uh, we have some winter weather capabilities in which we need to invest, and so I think that is the, um, the biggest root cause we found so far, and so that will take the likely the largest amount of our effort and, and our funding. Thank you. So of all your annual technology spending, was Southwest prioritizing its crew software for upgrades prior to December? Uh, thank you, Senator. We were, uh, uh, that spending was a cross of operation. Uh, the uh, crew spending was in the earlier stages of uh, it, it, its uh, modernization, so to speak, whereas uh, maintenance had just been finished and, and flight operations are, is about midway. Sounds like it was in the mix, but it wasn't the priority. It was part of a total technology upgrade plan. That's what uh, it sounds like. Thank you, Senator. It was more timing. Uh, the, uh, the timing doesn't necessarily mean priority, so it's very important we will fund it. But the, uh, the maintenance system came first, and then it came uh, our ground operations, and now we're working on the flight operations. So thanks to uh, or Mr. Watterson, thanks to airline deregulation, customers have many low-cost low cost flying options, and they get to vote with their feet and with their dollars. So it's obvious that you all messed up, and your customers, they expect you to fix it. So will you commit to keeping us informed on the steps your company is taking to make sure that these meltdowns never happen again? Uh, absolutely, Senator. We'll definitely follow up. Thank you. Well, I again, I want to thank the panel. Consumers, again, they get to vote on airline policies and performance, especially with their feet. And that vote is where, that they, take, where they take their business. Travelers should never have to experience what happened over Christmas again. When carriers melt down, they need to fix the problem and regain customers' trust. Thanks to deregulation and increased customer choice, airlines already have a powerful incentive to provide services in ways that their customers find valuable, and we should keep it that way. Thank you. I will recognize myself, five minutes for questions. Um, Mr. Watterson, Chicago is home to Midway Airport, um, Southwest's second largest base of operations, and what happened over Christmas was appalling. We've heard many of these stories already today, and I'm going to add to them because it's important to keep telling these stories because these are individual human beings who were significantly affected. One Chicagoan who was scheduled to fly with two young children to see their grandparents checked their coats and the children's car seats, only to be told their flight was canceled. And because of a staffing shortage, there was no one who could return those essential items to them. Imagine going without coats in Chicago in December. It's dangerous, and so is putting children, small children, in a car without a car seat. It's actually illegal. I don't know what a family like this was supposed to do, or how they were even able to get out of their airport and home safely. Another Southwest customer with stage four cancer got stuck in Chicago while trying to fly home for treatment. And the thing that I find so shocking is that while all these delays and cancellations were happening and passengers were calling Southwest for help, it took hours to reach a live person, if they ever reached a live person at all. Mr. Watterson, will Southwest guarantee that passengers on canceled flights will be able to reach a live person within a reasonable amount of time when they call Southwest for help? Just say yes or no. It's a simple question. Uh, thank you, Senator. In a normal disruption, uh, we aim for a three to nine minute uh, average speed of answer, uh, and that's how we fund our, our union represented uh, call centers. What is your, what is acceptable to you in terms of delay when it's not a normal disruption? Three days? 
unfortunately, Senator, it, is, it was a disservice to all your, your constituents that we had during that period of time, despite having all of our people that were available uh, working and on overtimes, uh, it, there was no amount of people we could have put in place to handle all the calls at that time because of the, the scale of the disruption. Okay, so you, you won't guarantee that um, in a cancel flight, especially in an instance like that, that anybody will be able to reach a live person at Southwest. That's what you're telling me. Senator, in a day like today or, uh, or an analogous day, yes, we will be able to an exact repeat of that situation. I apologize, we can't staff, there's no way we could staff that, that high. Okay. So maybe they need to come to a senator and we'll call a hearing and then we'll hand you pieces of paper with names and phone numbers on them. That's how people will, will get reached. I mean, there are people still waiting to hear from Southwest to reach a live person and it's been a month. Oh, I'm, I'm deeply sorry, Senator. We're, our average speed of answer yesterday was two minutes, and so we, we, we've definitely staffed, and to the extent people are not getting through, I deeply apologize, and definitely please hand me the piece of paper and I'll follow up. For someone with a disability, such as a visual impairment, the inability to reach someone by phone at Southwest is especially frustrating. Not all websites and mobile apps are easily accessible for persons with disabilities, despite existing guidelines and industry best practices, and also law, the ADA. Mr. Watterson, when was the last time Southwest reviewed its website and smartphone app to ensure that it is fully accessible for passengers with disabilities? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. I'm unsure of the exact time that, that we uh, did that last review. I will say that our vice president over call centers is visually impaired and that's a passion point for him. Okay, well, I wanna know when the last time that you reviewed was. If you could just get back to me, that would yes, be- Yes, ma'am, I will. Thank you. Ms. Pinkerton, I'm, I'm working on legislation to require the Department of Transportation to audit air carrier website accessibility. Given A4A's recent accessibility efforts, am I safe to presume that I can count on your organization's support for establishing such a requirement? I'm, I'm absolutely happy to, to work with you on that, Senator Baldwin. I heard you loud and clear in your previous statements. Um, especially about the wheelchair damage. And um, as you probably are aware, our CEOs recently recommitted to doing better on accessibility issues. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it includes having an advisory committee at each airline, with it, and the disability community is part of that to hear those concerns. Um, we've also committed to retraining all of our frontline employees and improving that training. And we've also committed to, thirdly, working with the, dis the disability community, identifying the barriers in the planes, and studying and trying to develop standards to provide better access. So um, I just want you to know uh, this has taken on um, a, a new level of importance um, at our organization and our, and our CEOs. We're committed to doing better. Okay. Well, I look forward to working with you on it. Um, for, my, for my final question, you know, what is particularly frustrating about this meltdown is that Captain Murray and others literally warned the, that Southwest was one bad storm away from suffering serious disruption. Clearly, Southwest failed to heed the warnings of its frontline personnel. And I just have to say that um, we, we need to be reminded that the air crews are responsible for people's lives. This is just about lost luggage. These are, these are professionals who commit every day to keeping their passengers safe and to making, not just for getting people from one place to another, but literally to, to safeguard their lives. And I think we often forget the role that air crew members play. Um, Mr. Watterson, what specific steps is Southwest implementing over the course of this year to earn back the trust of your flight crews, your gate agents, and all the other frontline personnel who were thrown into the breach by this collapse that many of your own personnel predicted was, could happen at the very next instance of significantly bad weather, and then it did. What are you doing to earn back the, the trust of your crews and, and, and personnel? Thank you, Senator. That's a very important point for us to do. And so within our lessons learned work, we look at systemic issues we face here. We're involving our, our union leaders, uh, both in the input stage right now of what they, their opinions of what went wrong. We had a session with uh, both our, our, our flight attendant and pilot unions, as well as our other, other work, uh, frontline workforces. And we committed to them that once we have a comprehensive view of what went wrong, we will then share the uh, recommendations out of that and work with them on developing the details uh, of that. Because I think the involving them in the work to make sure this doesn't happen again is the best way to show engagement uh, uh, to, um, um, with them and to make sure it doesn't happen again. 
I'm going to ask you a question for the record, and I want you to respond to me in, in writing. Um, please explain the specific benchmark Southwest must hit in the coming months and years to fulfill your promise that this will never happen again, and make sure to address how the company will transparently measure progress and hold executives accountable for missing those benchmarks. Thank you, Senator. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize uh, my colleague from Missouri, Senator Smith, my Thank neighbor. You. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also want to just uh, preface this by saying it's an honor to serve on this committee. Uh, the state of Missouri has had for nearly 50 years someone on this committee uh, to ask, ask important questions and advocate for the people of the state. Southwest, of course, serves St. Louis and Kansas City, uh, uh, probably the principal carrier, certainly in St. Louis, I know, in, in Kansas City, too. And so I'm not going to rehash a lot of the questions that have been asked. I do want to ask, though, specifically on the IT and the technology issues that have been identified as part of the problem what is the plan moving forward for that kind of maintenance and repair? Is there a schedule that's been put forth uh, from an operational perspective? How are you guys addressing this in the long term? Uh, thank you, Senator. So with regards to our, our flight uh, scheduling software, there was a specific uh, issue we had during the, during the disruption, and that one will be put in, a uh, fix we put in tomorrow into production. But the overall uh, flight scheduling uh, um, uh, system, we, we're looking to um, uh, upgrade or replace that. So we've uh, conducted a request for information from software vendors, evaluated those, and we'll be going to a, re a request for uh, proposal here after we had the findings from our assessment of what went wrong and after we uh, re-engage with, uh, with our flight attendant and pilot unions. Now, is that the Sky Solver so uh, software? Uh, the, the system we call Sky Solver, Senator, is uh, what has a, for patch, for lack of a better word, they'll be implemented tomorrow. Uh, SkySolver is a decision support tool, not necessarily a scheduling tool. The scheduling tool underneath that is the one that functioned fine during the, during the, during the meltdown, that is one that we're looking to replace uh, over the uh, course of this year and next, and that's one that we'll engage with our unions on. Okay. Um, and then, Dr. Winston, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, are you there, Dr. Winston? Dr. Winston? No longer? Okay. Yes, I'm there. Oh, okay. There we go. Um, thank you. And I, uh, I know that uh, we've obviously been very focused on uh, what happened with Southwest, but there was a um, more disruption in travel in January. And as you may recall, thousands of flights uh, couldn't take off because of a failure of the FAA's uh, NOTAM system. And I think it was Captain Murray that mentioned um, the normalizing of organizational drift. And I want to address that here with the Department of Transportation as it considers more red tape and regulations. In uh, December of 21, 2021, the system known as the Notice to Airmen system was changed to the Notice to Air Mission Systems to be, as I quote, quote, more inclusive to all aviators and missions. And with the 23 FAA reauthorization bill approaching, how can we ensure that the FAA stays true to its mission of making sure that uh, it's the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world as opposed to this kind of virtue signaling? Well, I think the, the position that we've had now for many, many years is that it's really a bad idea to have the FAA both be a regulatory agency and a technology agency. It's not really equipped to do both. And I think the, re the general recommendation is that we split the FAA to have a regulatory part and a technology part. And that that technology part should be privatized. And the model for that is Air Canada. And I think that's really where we can make progress. And as you know, you know FAA has been talking about a new air traffic control s system for decades, and repeatedly it's found to be over budget, behind schedule, but most importantly, it's behind the technology. You know, other countries have satellite-based air traffic control. You know, give much more freedom to more efficient flight paths to pilots. We don't have that. We still have a radar-based system. And uh, that's obviously something that puts us behind. So I think the, the recommendation of legislation that's been around for quite a while to separate uh, FAA into a regulatory group and then have a new group to do uh, work on the technology is sound, and that's what I would suggest that you focus on. Dr. Winston, just to follow up on that, do you know how much time was spent, um, again, starting to address this kind of language as opposed to putting that time and effort into making sure the system works best for customers and that it's on time and it's safe? Because this is not the first time the Department of Transportation is engaged, again, in this kind of virtue signaling. Are you aware of how much time or 
How could that time be better spent? Well, it, 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 if we're interested, frankly, in improving air travel and reducing delays and cancellations, start with the airports. I'm serious. Introduce congestion pricing at airports. That could make an incredible difference in terms of the efficiency of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, or Madam Chairman. Thank you. Um, as you can see, many of the members have gone to vote. We're, we're um, voting on the floor right now. So I am going to uh, put the hearing into a recess subject to the call of the chair. Thank you. You know, one of the issues that we definitely want to look at in the FAA bill and uh, something that came up in the conversation, maybe I could get a little bit of input on, is uh, what is this uh, staffing capacity issue? Does anybody have a number for it? Does anybody have a percentage of increase over what our current system is that we think that we need to be skilling and training for that would help us build the kind of capacity that we need? We can talk later about whether we think the model that, say, United or other people have, which is, I think, a little bit about overstaffing and thus being able to handle outages and systems better. But let's just get an idea of what people think are the issues for staffing right now that we need to do and upskilling uh, for the workforce that we need. So yes. that I'm clear, Senator, are you talking about the FAA or, or the carriers? I'm, I'm, I throw it all in. I care about an aviation system that works. Uh, the se safety and security bill that we've worked on clearly identified the needs of the FAA. We feel like the FAA needs a lot more technical workforce to keep pace with the level of innovation. But we, I'm sure my members of both sides will show up and say that you know their economies are constrained by lack of pilots. You know, I have an airport in my state, Wenatchee, where people are telling them, well, we can only have one flight a day because we don't have enough pilots. We can't have rural economies basically be strangled hold because we don't have enough pilots. So we need to figure this out. So anybody who has a thought on where we need to go in building capacity that way. Okay, we'll go right down the line. Thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, we think that uh, there are a number of things that could be used um, to... Uh, take care of that problem. Right now, the airlines set their own requirements for reserve capacity, whether it's uh, personnel or equipment. There are, no, there are no minimum standards set by the government. Um, so we think that there needs to be some minimum standard for that. Because the way it is now, uh, some airlines are actually operating on negative reserves. Um, so in, in a perfect day, they cancel at least one to up to three or four percent of their flights. That saves them money. And as I indicated in, in my earlier testimony, we need to change the financial incentives from offering bad service that's profitable, and in this case, unreliability or unsafe, to service that is good for the system and good for the consumer. Um, with regard to uh, supply of pilots, we made a number of suggestions in June of, of last year. It's attached to my testimony. Uh, two of them were to authorize um, temporarily um, raising the age of mandatory retirement from 65 to 68 with good health. Uh, second one was to offer temporary visas to foreign pilots that are already authorized by the FAA to fly to and from the United States, to fly uh, temporarily within the United States. And the third proposal is to set a minimum, um, a minimum wage for commercial airline pilots because we've increased the, the hours up to 1,500 as a minimum. But the, um, in many cases, the uh, starting pilots especially are at a very, very low wage. And that, restrict supply as to those other things. Thank you. I see my colleagues have a right. I don't know whether Senator Blackburn is ready to go. She's ready to go. Senator Blackburn. So I will pick up right where you are. Uh, Senator Graham has a, a bill that would allow pilots. Is your microphone on? Yeah. Okay. It is. Or is it picking up? Okay. Uh, that would allow, let's see what he calls this thing. 
Let Experienced Pilots Fly Act. And it would allow pilots to fly up until age 67. So what I would like to hear, Mr. Watterson, let me start with you. Uh, see what you think about that. And then let's see, is it Captain Murray? I'd like to hear from you on this also. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I would respectfully say that I, I think more can be done on the other end of, of the spectrum, so to speak. Um, it, it takes uh, far too much money for an airline pilot to go through schooling and get the experience to qualify to become an airline pilot. Other professions in the United States receive uh, uh, government assistance and education process, and that's not to a full extent available to, to pilots. Well, that takes, that takes time, sir. So I'm talking about alleviating issues today. I live in Nashville, fly you all a lot. Um, I know sometimes we have grouchy uh, flight attendants on planes, people that are overworked. I talk to pilots, they're doing yeoman's work and God bless them all and all the ticket agents and gate agents that work so hard through this debacle. So this is something that could be done in the short term. You're talking about a long-term fix. I'm talking about today. So just answer me yes or no, would you uh, support that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Unfortunately, uh, I'll defer to uh, uh, Captain Murray. We, we stand behind our pilots okay. union with regard to age lines. All right, Captain. Well, <clears throat> and mine won't be a simple yes or no. Um, I, I, I'm, I believe very strongly, especially with FAA reauthorization, that a lot of our issues with um, where the pilot shortage is occurring is, is at the evaluation level and, and FAA availability to really test pilots and, and help them come up and, and get through check rides. And so moving forward, that's where we have to address it is, is really at the cradle. I've, I've spent a fair amount of time with... Um, uh, well, and I agree with that. Yeah. And when we do the FAA reauth, we can have those discussions. A part of that is someone who is 65 years old today and is going to turn 66 next month, and they are in good health, and they have a great record, and they want to continue to fly for a year or two. Uh, it is allowing them to stay and to continue to work. That is simply what this bill does. And, and what, what we saw in 2008 with the age 60 to 65 mm -hmm. had some caveats in there as, as we, uh, um, it, having to do with medicals, having to do with, with who flew, uh, there were ICAO issues. And so we would have to see how that is addressed um, in, in, in allowing from 65 to seven or eight, um, however that okay. goes. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Um, let's see, I, Ms. Pinkerton, I wanna ask you about this. Uh, we have seen fuel cost escalate. And I know for years, Southwest had uh, done a pre-purchase on their fuel, and they kept the cost low. Uh, it helped with their ticket price. And right now, one of the things that I hear um, from pilots and others is the accelerated cost of fuel and the effect that that has had and how airline companies are having to take funds that were set aside for other activity and place it to cover fuel cost. Uh, give me your read on that, what you see. Well, uh, definitely fuel prices uh, in 2022 were up 87% over the, over the prior year. So there's no doubt. And then in the month of January, we saw it go up even further. So it's the price of oil, but we also have a unique situation with jet fuel that has to be refined separately. Right. And we've got, frankly, refinery shortages uh, in this country. So and so supply chain issues all Exactly, add to it. exactly. It's, it's okay, definitely. Okay, let me, Mr. Watterson, um, how has the increased cost of fuel affected you all? Did that take money away from other projects like enhancing your technology? Uh, thank you, Senator. We're, um, it doesn't uh, take it necessarily directly away from our other projects. We are experiencing elevated both 
uh, fuel cost, but also what's called the crack spread. The difference between a price of oil and the price of jet fuel is elevated because of refinery capacity issues. Okay, thank you for that. Madam Chairman, I hope that as we look at this issue and look at FAA RIOS, that we will hear from some of the other airlines about their response on this December uh, storm. I know that there are airlines that have not made refunds. I know there are airlines, I know families that booked with air miles and the flight got canceled, but they won't give the air miles back to people. You're, you're and this was, they had no control over this. So it is not just Southwest. I think Allegiant, American, Delta, all of these, JetBlue, uh, we need to hear from all of them on how they're dealing with these issues. I, I couldn't agree more, Senator Blackburn. Thank you. Consumers de deserve refunds. If yes, we give, they do. If we give a licensure through the FAA to certify that you can be an air carrier to deliver service, you need to deliver it or give a refund. Okay, uh, Senator Cinema is next. Thank you, Chair Cantwell, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. Southwest Airlines is one of the largest airlines serving my home state of Arizona, with a base at Phoenix Sky Harbor and a significant footprint at Tucson International. And due to Southwest's connection with my state, our office has heard from many, many Arizonans who were impacted by Southwest's 15,000 flight cancellations over the holidays. In many cases, these Arizonans were unable to be with their families for Christmas. And many Americans who wanted to celebrate the holidays on vacation in Arizona couldn't make it there, which hurt both the travelers and the small businesses in Arizona who were ready to welcome them to the state. So just like so many Arizonans, the staff of Senate offices were also impacted by Southwest cancellations. One of my staffers was stranded at his connecting airport, rebooked on a flight multiple days later, which was incidentally also canceled, and never made it home for the holidays because of the disruption. So my first question is for Mr. Watterson. We know that many Southwest passengers, like my staffer, were stranded for days at their connecting airports. And my question is, what, are the, what did Southwest do, if anything, as the cancellations increased to ensure that passengers with special needs, like unaccompanied minors, persons with disabilities, those with dietary restrictions, were safe and able to obtain food and lodging, particularly when many businesses were closed on Christmas Day? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the, for the question. Uh, with uh, regards to unaccompanied minors um, and young travelers, uh, early in disruption, I can't remember exactly what day, but we can follow up with your staff, uh, we prohibited the, the travel uh, of uh, young travelers uh, under the age 18 and, and unaccompanied minors on connecting journeys. Uh, that we allowed them on uh, just a point-to-point -point flight. That way we reduced the risk of them being stranded because of a, a, a disruption in the connecting point. Um, with regards to um, uh, uh, um, travelers' disabilities, uh, we certainly, in a retrospective, looked at uh, the number of our uh, uh, complaints uh, and failures with regards to uh, uh, assistive devices, and we found uh, 11 of those, and in each 11 of those, we offered in, uh, uh, replacement services for the, those customers uh, while, um, uh, while we, we serviced their equipment. And that rate was um, uh, similar to the rate uh, we experienced during normal times, which uh, we believe is still too high and have efforts on the way to lower that. Thank you, Senator. Uh, according to your website, Southwest has committed to, quote, reimbursing reasonable expenses incurred as a result of disruption, including meals, hotel accommodations, and alternate transportation. And on the website, the word reimbursement is used repeatedly. Yet the calls I'm getting to my office um, say that when folks are receiving these payments, the payments are being labeled as settlements instead of reimbursements. Now, not everyone understands the difference there, but as I'm sure you appreciate, the term settlement implies that customers are agreeing to forfeit their rights to pursue legal remedies, something that's not disclosed to customers on the website when they're uploading their receipts for reimbursement. So why is Southwest describing these payments as reimbursements on the website, but as settlements when the payment is made? That's my first question. And my second question is to ask you for a commitment that despite this language change, I'd like you to make clear that Southwest is not arguing that a customer has waived their legal rights because they followed your company's instructions to submit receipts for reimbursement. 
Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. I, I've, I have, was unaware that on the uh, um, payment website that it was labeled settlement. That I, I, we did not mean it to be that way. We only meant it to be we're returning your your, your money uh, and, and nothing else. So I'll. Okay, I'll, so I'll, folks. So you do on. So you believe that um, Southwest customers do retain all of their legal rights and are not waiving them when they receive their reimbursements. Uh, I, I'm unfamiliar with the the, the, um, uh, the topic, Senator. Is our intention just to refund people's money and not take away the legal rights? I can certainly follow up with that. I apologize. I don't know the information off the top. Right. Good. Well, that commitment is very important. Um, on the topic of reimbursements, we heard that Southwest wasn't promising to reimburse expenses until multiple days after the cancellations began. So a lot of customers in the early days didn't book alternative transportation. Like they didn't book expensive alternative flights because they didn't know whether or not Southwest would pay them back. So my question is, why did it take so long to make this commitment? And for customers who are concerned about this for the future, I'm asking that you update your contract of carriage to clearly state that reasonable expenses will be reimbursed in the event that a similar disruption occurs in the future. Uh, thank you, Senator. The uh, early part of disruption was a weather event like everyone uh, else uh, experienced, and then it turned into a, a crew-driven ex uh, uh, event that only we experienced. And when uh, that happened, uh, my recollection is that we then changed our language uh, to, to be um, uh, that we would reimburse. And then uh, uh, I, think, I believe we've held true to that word as well. And that uh, as far as the, the updates to our uh, our contract of carriage, I believe we are consistent with the FA, with the, excuse me, the DOT policy. We certainly want and endeavor to reimburse our customers, but I will commit to you that we'll go back and where we look at that, that uh, language and make sure it is up to date. Thank you. Chair Cantwell, I know my time has expired, so I'm going to submit another question for the record about code sharing and interline agreements around rebooking on other lines. I don't have time to get to that today, but it is something I'm very concerned about, and so I'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, Senator Rosen. There we go. Had to find, get the unmute button to work. Uh, thank you, Chair Cantwell, uh, Ranking Member Cruz. Today's hearing is so important as uh, I don't have to tell anyone here that uh, Nevada's tourist economy, it is the backbone of our state. And like my colleagues, I agree that it is unacceptable that thousands of flights during the busiest travel season of the year were canceled or significantly delayed. They left many travelers stranded, affecting plans to be with families and loved ones. And like every other state, these cancellations had a devastating impact on families across Nevada. I received messages from all around the state, people who were affected by this unmitigated disaster. One gentleman wrote to me about spending all of Christmas Day at the Reno Tahoe Airport after multiple flight cancellations going back at 4 a.m. on Christmas Eve morning. Another constituent emails me about cancellations. Stranding his family on the way home to Las Vegas cost him more than $3,000 in alternative transportation and lodging. Besides all this impact to travelers, the cancellations also hurt the workers in my state. They are the backbone of Nevada's travel, tourism, and hospitality industry. It hurt our airports, which are the gateways to our economy, and it will hurt the future travel to my state if we don't fix the problems caused by this calamity right away. And so, I'm a former computer programmer. I'm going to talk a little bit about IT integration here. I want to discuss Southwest technology infrastructure. Mr. Watterson, we've heard today the primary reason for the meltdown in December was a system failure based uh, caused by your outdated optimization technology. Well, I know when you mix a decades old IT system that the airlines outgrown with a staffing shortage and winter storms, the busiest travel season of the year, the end result, well, we know what it was, over 15,000 flights canceled, people sleeping in airports, people missing holidays or medication, so on and so forth. It might have been the perfect storm, but it was entirely predictable. So, Mr. Watterson, in addition to the upgrades you plan to make as a result of this incident, does Southwest have a long-term plan for its, what is your plan for long-term technology, for the integration of these outdated systems, and what's your next phase, and what is that long-term strategic plan that the traveling public, number one, 
and then the hospitality industry that relies for jobs and income on people traveling. What is your long range plan so you don't outgrow these systems as well? Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Um, with regards to the, uh, um, uh, the, the our disruption, uh, technology was a issue. It wasn't the uh, root issue, but there was there is technology work to do as a result, and we will certainly fund that uh, both out of our, our current plans and incremental money that's necessary. Additionally, the the root cause we believe of the disruption was our capacity to handle winter operations, and that needs substantial improvement uh, this year. And so that's what we will endeavor to, to fix this year. But over a multi-year period, we will be going through every part of our operation and. Modernizing. It's one of the uh, tenets of, uh, of our new CEO to modernize the operation over the next three years. And so we will be uh, proceeding a pace in, in every work group, whether it's technology, equipment, or processes. And so I'm going to build on that because, of course, we have a hospitality workforce. And our hospitality and our travel, the ecosystem of travel, re relies on flight, on staffing. Flight crews on the plane, maintenance people, baggage handlers off the plane, all of that. So it relies on staffing to be sure that people who are traveling get to where they need to go. So can you talk about your staffing a little bit? How has the disruptions over the holiday season, how it impacted your pilots, your flight attendants, other airline employees, like I said, baggage handlers, gate agents and the like? Um, how do we be sure that uh, they're taken care of and this uh, uh, not going to happen to them in the future? Did you uh, did you reimburse them for all the accommodations and meals, transportation if they were stranded? Uh, thank you, Senator. Our, our people were the hero of the event. Uh, the, they showed up. We had absolutely uh, no problem with attendance uh, and uh, nor service. And so we're very grateful for how our people showed up. Um, there's no way we can give back the time that was uh, taken from them, uh, but we uh, were able to show them some gratitude with the uh, incremental pay. Um, and then we're going to be involving them in our efforts to make sure this doesn't happen again. I think that's the, probably the biggest thing we can do. And then, of course, I just have a few seconds left, but uh, how are you working with the airports? Uh, every airport, and every major airport in states, this is a huge economic driver. Again, um, the ripple effects for the related entities, airport concessionaires and their workforce. Uh, are you working with airports? Can you tell us briefly what you're doing to be sure uh, the impact on their staff that uh, um, is so great? Uh, thank you, Senator. There are specific airports where we had infrastructure shortcomings, not because the airport failed to provide it, but uh, because we did not ask for it. And now we will uh, ask for incremental infrastructure uh, as part of our effort to uh, revamp our winter operations. And I'm going to submit this for the record because we'd like some actual data. But do you, does everyone have their uh, their luggage, their strollers, their other essentials, wheelchairs? Uh, you can respond to that. I'm sure I might have somebody after me. And I've gone over my time, but uh, I want to be sure that every everyone who is traveling is reunited with the important items that they left home with. Um. Yeah, yes, Senator, we've, re we've, re we've returned every single bag except for those 200 we still have that have no markings nor identifying information that we're holding, and we will continue to hold those until we can find somebody who, uh, who owns it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll pick up where Senator Rosen uh, concluded there. Um, from a, a reimbursement perspective, well, I'm, I'm pleased to see that Southwest is taking its commitment to customers seriously, providing reimbursements and refunds, points, and direct deliveries. We've heard from colleagues today that many constituents that we have across the country still have not been made whole. Uh, nonetheless, I, I hope that there's a process that we can talk about um, as our offices are working on this with everyone. You, you, Southwest has set up a, a portal, um, but uh, if there's a way for our offices with constituent services to be able to work with our constituents, and make sure that we're pointing them in the right place, um, that would be appreciated. And I hope you all can let us know what that is and where, where it is and who the person is for us to work with. Um, can you share the number of customers who have not received reimbursements? Uh, thank you, Senator. Let me uh, consult my, um, my notes here. Uh, Senator, we've had uh, 284,188 um, uh, uh, cases, eligible cases submitted, and we have uh, uh, reimbursed 273,406, 
and that leaves uh, 10,782 that have not yet been reimbursed, but those are ones that have been uh, um, uh, submitted most recently, and we were within the DOT timelines of 30 days for processing all those. I appreciate those numbers. Mr. Watterson, is Southwest still working to follow through to ensure 100% of your customers are made whole, including reaching out to customers who may be unaware of the available remedies via mail or phone? Uh, yeah, Senator, we emailed every single uh, person that was disrupted and gave them points as well as apologized and gave them resources to contact us back um, uh, should they need so. Do you know that every Southwest customer that was impacted has an email? Uh, we know which ones do and do not. Uh, the large, large majority have an email as part of their um, uh, purchase. You have to enter an email to get your receipt. Uh, so except for exceptionally small circumstances, everyone has an email, Senator. So for the folks that don't have an email that you've identified, how have you reached out to them? Uh, I'm unaware I can follow up with you, Senator. It's a, it's a very small number. I appreciate that. Well, I, I hope that they're not just left out to say, oh, well, that's the cost of doing business. Because it turns out in America, the, you know, connectivity is... is it's a problem. Um, so coming from a more rural state, I just hope that we, we can get there. So I look forward to hearing back there yeah. as well. Yes, Senator. Now, several of my colleagues today have raised concerns about the fact that Southwest frontline employees from pilots to flight attendants to customer service representatives have been sounding the alarm on many of these known issues for years. And yet Southwest did not implement changes to address them. I'm disappointed to hear that the voices of staff on the front lines of Southwest Airlines operations, including pilots, flight attendants, and customer service representatives, have not been a priority. Mr. Watterson, I want to follow up on your commitment to my colleague, Senator Duckworth, that your frontline employees will be at the decision-making tables as Southwest reflects on the December 2022 meltdown. Uh, thank you, Senator. Yes, we have involved all of our uh, unions uh, from our front line in our uh, lessons learned. We're looking at understanding what went wrong. And then once we synthesize that into what we should do about it, we will re-engage with each union and, and with the um, with the efforts that were, you know, uh, were relevant to their work group and involve them in the plan for going forward. I appreciate that change. As a result of implementing that change, is Southwest considering changes to the management structure and decision-making process to ensure the voices of your frontline workers are heard and prioritized as part of Southwest decision-making process. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I think with um, uh, certain of our, our work groups, our um, relationship has maybe atrophied, and um, I've committed uh, in my position to uh, re-engage and work with their, with their uh, elected uh, union officials to um, develop a better relationship, maybe a return of a better relationship with, with those work groups. That's a yes to the question? Uh, I believe the Senator. Uh, maybe I misunderstood the question. So Southwest, in addition to the change that you just laid out to me with creating a process to hear from more frontline employees, has Southwest also changed its management structure to ensure that that's included? Um, uh, I'm sorry, Senator, was specifically what, um, what kind of things did you have in mind? I'm not sure I followed the question. They weren't being listened to before. So if they weren't being listened to before, your management structure told them Thanks for being here, but I'm not going to listen to you. So have you changed your management structure so that that does not happen again? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the explanation. Yes, we have made management changes, and we will change our management practices more than the structure of how we engage with our, with our, with our union leaders going forward. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. I'm sure. Thanks, sir. Senator Young, and then Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Sullivan. Well, I thank our witnesses for uh, for being here today. and, and um, I know a number of my constituents are, are tuning in for this hearing because um, the recent challenges uh, experienced by Southwest have, have impacted some of them uh, in a really personal way. Um, this whole situation is sort of interesting to me, not in an academic way, but I, I think academics will take note. I mean, this will be like a business case study moving forward from uh, the lead up to the Christmas time flight issues uh, to the initial response the realization that th things have really hit the fan, and, um, and th now the current response uh, by businesses. And, and to me, it's an illustration, um, as, as I watch it play out, that the market really can work. I think a number of consumers are, are making up their mind. Are they going to continue to, um, are they going to continue to do business with Southwest Airlines? In my experience, most will probably conclude yes because of the value proposition. 
Um, others haven't made up their mind yet and, and, and so forth. But uh, that ability to exercise choice, which is the hallmark of, of uh, the free enterprise system, is, uh, is playing out before our eyes. And I think we have to be re really careful here as, as we discuss an appropriate regulatory framework not to overshoot and limit choice too much. Uh, so um, <clears throat> all of us here, I think without exception, would say government has an appropriate role to play regulating, especially in the area of safety, regulating um, our, our, our carriers. Okay. I think it's very important to make sure that we don't uh, destroy the, the uh, proverbial goose that lays the golden egg. Now, with that lead in, I, I want to ask a question to uh, Dr. Winston. I think he might be joining us remotely. That's my hope. Um, <clears throat> because in his testimony, he discusses uh, a few policies that would enable the US aviation system to more effectively respond to unexpected events, events like the Christmas time uh, flight challenges. So I asked Dr. Winston, if, if, if you're still there, sir, can, can, you just, can you discuss some of those policies, namely the issue of foreign competition and cabotage rights? Okay, well, that, you know, the, what we're talking about there is there's a longer run policy. Um, and the idea, obviously, is to stimulate airline competition with all the benefits that we've already received from deregulation and effectively another round. You'll have more people then competing on routes and offering new innovative services, and there'll be spare capacity, so to speak, or at least additional capacity. You know, I've had experiences, probably everyone has, had a canceled flight on one carrier, but there was another airline operating at the airport, and I went to them and, and took that flight. So those kinds of backups uh, could be around and, uh, and would help. But I think the other one that point that I keep on harping on that doesn't seem to get much attention is the role of airports. Remember, all this is happening at airports, right? It's, it's, it's their property, so to speak. What are they doing to be working with carriers and trying to pro provide transparent information and accommodating them in some kind of sleeping arrangements so that things break down? I think that is where we need to stimulate much more competition and interaction, where airports have an incentive to work with airlines and have the airports, for example, be in charge of de-icing. It's kind of amazing that the airlines have their, that responsibility. The airports should be doing that. And I think they would compete to yeah. do that. So I think it's the combination, both the infrastructure and competition, that's going to get you know improve things greatly. Dr. Winston, thank you for that response. And, and uh, with your indulgence, I'd, I'd like a member of my staff uh, to follow up with you about those suggestions, if that's OK. Sure. All right. Uh, Ms. Pinkerton, your association represents a number of US airlines. And I'm interested in the broader context about what's happening industry-wide um, and what should happen to passenger carriers as a whole in response to uh, this high-profile flight disruption. Uh, can you briefly touch on whatever piece you think is relevant about um, the state of the industry and, and being concerned about efforts to re-regulate the industry? Well, absolutely. As I explained um, in my testimony, I think um, carriers at the beginning of 2022 um, saw that they were living in a post-pandemic world. They adjusted their their schedules, they reduced their schedules, and they went on a hiring binge. All of our carriers have done that, and then they focused on making sure that the schedule they put out, that they have the resources um, to, to meet that schedule. So I, I take uh, what Chair Cantwell said very seriously. Um, accountability is appropriate. But what the concern is here, for example, in the refund space, I said in the last three years, since the pandemic, we've refunded $32 billion worth of cash refunds. So, and we've brought the complaint rate down to 0.01%. So that's just one example of a place where I think there, you know, there is plenty of incentive. The customers are voting with their feet, their wallets. Um, they will make decisions about what carrier they want to fly. But I think it's important since we know that deregulation has reduced airfares dramatically, brought us more service and more choice, not to overreact on the regulatory framework with a one-size-fits-all. 
um, type of approach. Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Hickenlooper. And after Senator Hickenlooper, uh, Senator um, Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for taking your time out of your busy lives to be here with us. Um, uh, Ms. Pinkerton, uh, the FAA has an important mandate to ensure passengers have reliable, safe, accessible access to tra air travel. Uh, agency oversight rule applies to large hub airports, essential air services for rural communities, uh, and more. Uh, Ms. Pinkerton, what would the FAA do to improve air service with a permanent Senate-confirmed administrator in place? Uh, probably a better question for FAA, but I can say what we would uh, like a new administrator um, to do is uh, to uh, exercise um, leadership. And I think one thing that's essential um, to support small community service is having um, the adequate staffing and technology at the FAA, quite frankly. I mean, the, um, it's very important. The National Air Traffic Controllers Association has told us there's a controller a shortage. We know that for small communities, there's a serious pilot supply issue. I want to applaud those who are working on legislation that would provide aid for pilot education and training. Um, those are the types of things we would hope a new administrator could focus on. Great. Thank you. And I, I, the FAA is not here, per se. They're here. Um, but I just wanted to speak to the uh, other committee members that uh, President Biden re-nominated in January Phil Washington to become the, uh, the first African-American to lead FAA. Um, and he's someone I worked with a number of years. I want to just make sure that the, the other committee members know that this is long overdue. We need leadership at that level. And this is a classic example of where that would be needed. Uh, Mr. Washington uh, served our country for 24 years in the U.S. Army. He rose to the Manca the rank of command sergeant major, which means he's one of those people that actually gets things done. Uh, some people say he hasn't had enough air experience, but uh, immediately following the winter storm catastrophe, uh, Mr. Washington is now the head of uh, the third busiest airport in the world, uh, Denver International Airport. Uh, Mr. Washington, uh, after that winter storm catastrophe, uh, he launched an after action review uh, with its airline partners, including Southwest Airlines, uh, and they are hard charging in terms of identifying operational barriers and methods to improve service in and out of DIA uh, and how to make sure that each airport's doing everything they can to make sure these things won't, or such an event doesn't happen again. Uh, Mr. Washington's led major transportation organizations now for the last 12 years. He was the CEO. I first met him when he was running the regional transportation district in Colorado, which had passed fast tracks, 121 miles of new light rail track, the time the largest transit initiative in the, uh, in the modern history of the United States. Uh, he was so successful at that, we lost him. He was lured away to Los Angeles to run their county metropolitan transportation authority. Um, uh, and then he was brought back as the CEO of uh, DIA about three and a half years ago um, and Good. was appointed with unanimous support by city council. Uh, even as he hit, uh, came to DIA, he hit the ground running because he was in a situation we were at about 60 million or 65 million uh, uh, passengers every year in an airport that was designed for 50 million. Uh, he put the Great Hall Terminal Project, which had been through years of delays, got it right back on track and back on budget. Uh, it will modernize the airport's terminal and screening capacity dramatically. Uh, he launched DIA's Vision 100, which is an initiative to make sure that we can support 100 million annual passengers uh, by the end of this decade. Uh, and he created the first of its kind Center for Equity and Excellence in Aviation to grow a skilled and diverse uh, aviation workforce of tomorrow. Now, as Congress prepares to reauthorize FAA for the first time in, since 2018, it needs to have a permanent leader in place. Uh, the agency, I think, is hamstrung on major rulemakings without a permanent administrator. Uh, they need to be able to implement bipartisan infrastructure law programs. Um, I think Mr. Washington is uniquely and exceptionally qualified to serve at the FAA. He's got the, the military discipline, the organizational leadership, and the forward-looking vision. So I want to urge the, the committee 
uh, to make sure that we hold the hearings and get uh, Phil Washington's nomination confirmed ASAP. So you guys got off the hook there a little bit. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Well, I guess the uh, chair's left, so uh, I'm going to call on myself here. Um, <laughs> I was going to call on you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Captain Murray, I I'm curious about the role that the Pilots Association are going to play in the third party assessment that's being commissioned by Southwest. I'm a big fan of our uh, pilots, Lylot being the senator from Alaska. Um, and um, Know almost all. I feel like I know almost all the pilots up in Alaska. A lot of them are veterans. I'm sure a lot of them uh, are veterans in your organization. Uh, how are? How do you think you guys are going to fit into this assessment? And what are what are going to be the highlights from your perspective? Well, thank you, Senator, and thank you for the question. <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, SWAPA is is uniquely uh, qualified to. Um, uh, to provide uh, input, and, and we have been trying to do that for many years. Um, I like to say that uh, Southwest has an airline to run. We have an airline to analyze, and, and that's what we do, and we have some of the best in the world at, at analyzing. And um, it, as I've spoken about processes before, um, uh, that, that is where I feel, uh, along with, um, you know, NIT uh, support system for the correct processes, um, has to be addressed. Um, Mr. Watterson uh, just testified that, you know, tech was an issue, but not the issue. Um, and I agree. Um, he said primarily, though, it was the capacity to handle the storm. And with that, I, I, I disagree with. Um, we've been sounding the alarms for years. Um, and I know that's been echoed uh, in, in this room today. Um, over two dozen times through podcasts, through um, email blasts, um, we have um, been trying to draw attention to the chaos that, that, that all of our pilots um, have to deal with every day. And, uh, and so I, I, I am concerned moving forward that, um, that we're, we're not going to be addressed uh, or, or any of the frontline employees are going to be addressed as, as, as true partners. Yeah. And that has to be done. Well, I hope that happens. I mean... Um... Uh, Mr. Watterson, is that going to be, that's obviously going to be your intention. That's part of the reason you you brought the pilots in, I'm assuming, for the third-party assessment. And I'm sure you've seen the Captain, uh, Captain Murray's uh, testimony, which has these history of meltdowns that he lays out in this chart. Is that going to be your intention to work with them in terms of the assessment? Uh, yes, Senator. Um, we have met with them on a couple occasions. Um, we intend to meet with them on a lot more occasions. We also intend to improve uh, the processes Captain Murray um, uh, discusses. Uh, there's an effort that had already been started prior to the uh, disruption uh, to do exactly that, um, but it's certainly work ahead for us. Good. Um, I want to turn to the broader topic. I know we've already talked about it a lot. Um, uh, Ms. Pinkerton on the issue of technology, and then everybody else kind of weighing in. Uh, we had a... Um, well, I noticed the CEO of United Airlines, Scott Kirby, in his uh, tech infrastructure, um, well, it was an earnings call in mid-January. He said the FAA, as well as most airlines, with the exception of network characters, have, quote, outgrown their technology infrastructure and simply cannot operate reliably in this more challenge, challenging environment. Do you agree with that? And and do others agree with that? And what do we do about it? And, and is that both, is that, and, I, and I, I'm, I mean, obviously I'd rather have uh, Mr. Kirby speak to his own words, but is, do you think he's getting an aviation infrastructure technology or FAA or the combination of both? Yeah, so I, I won't address a, a particular um, airline's comments, but what I will do is speak for the entire industry. Well, he and was I've trying got, to speak to, and, you know, as the CEO of a big, big, prominent airlines, he probably has a pretty good purview. Uh, yes, I would. I would say um, I do as well. Having worked closely with with carriers now for hmm, over fifteen years, so I can tell you that this year, twenty twenty two, all of our carriers together made record investments in their people and then their product and technologies to make sure that they can recover 
from operational issues. We hired more people in 2022. You've heard we, we yep. needed that extra staffing, even for a smaller schedule. Technology is something that is a constant uh, refresh. I, I put these technology buckets and investments into three categories. One is for the passenger, the apps, the communication, um, the bag tracking that goes on automatically from your phone. Then we've got what we give our frontline employees. They've got iPads and, and Apple phones and technologies that they can use to assist uh, passengers. But then importantly, there's this operational technology bucket. And I can tell you our carriers have made um, done a lot of things that I think are actually instructive for the FAA, such as moving some of their on-site, on-premises technology to, to the cloud to make sure that, and then having, you know, an East Coast cloud and a West Coast cloud so that if the East Coast cloud goes down, you've still got the West Coast and you don't have everything at one low physical location. More operational kind of computing juice so that when you have this influx of data for, with irregular operations, you can handle it. So um, 21 billion is a record for investment, and we're forecasting 27 billion. I think carriers are absolutely taking the operational reliability and technology issues very seriously, and they're investing robust amounts of money. Let me ask, Madam, uh, Madam uh, Chair, can I ask one final question? I know I've run out of time, but um, you know, there's been a couple um, reports in the news just in the last month of some FA of some near misses uh, within our airline system. Uh, fortunately, n nothing happened in terms of an accident, but I think most Americans uh, take for granted but are proud of uh, how safe our passenger airline service is because it is quite remarkable when you think about it. But are there any things that you, um, uh, Ms. Pinker Pinkerton or anyone else on the panel think that we need to be thinking here to get ahead of the curve. What, what I always think when Congress is acting at its best, it's preempting challenges and getting in front of them before, you know, you don't want to have a hearing because there was a major midair crash, crash and the FAA realized it had a problem. From a safety perspective, is there anything right now that any of you would say, hey, make sure you're getting on this and watching it before something bad happens, none of which we, won't, we don't want anything bad to happen. I'll start with you. Yeah, and I, I can't obviously talk about um, in particular incidents that were under investigation, but I will tell you we are extremely proud of our safety record. Um, it's because we do things like um, uh, systems, uh, management systems, analysis of safety issues to see if there are trends and so we try to be more predictive in our um, work on safety than forensic, for example. Um, so I'm not aware that there are any troubling trends that are out there right now. And again, I think our safety record, um, I've seen a couple of stories post these incidents that compare our record. It's much safer to fly than it is to drive, be on a bus yep. or a train. Um, but that doesn't, we take every incident seriously and we learn from it. Any other panelists who want to just comment? Yeah, can I take, make a comment? Sure. Can I talk? Okay, so let me just stress again. I think the fundamental problem is that the government's comparative advantage is not really to manage and operate a technology uh, service. Uh, that's something the private sector can do much better. And that's why it's important to separate uh, FAA into a, into a safety regulatory uh, responsibility and have a new agency, preferably private, that's responsible for adapt, adopting a new technology for air traffic control that focuses on a constellation of satellites, which will keep much better watch on aircraft and expand airspace capacity in the process. I think that's really the first order of business if you really want to improve the system in the long run. Okay, quickly, Captain, Captain Murray and Mr. Hudson. Uh, yeah, I just want to add that um, that um, th there is an infrastructure issue that has to be addressed. That's what, what y'all will be doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, w w whatever failures occurred, and it's still under investigation, the, the latest one, um, at the end of the day, what saved those two airplanes was a experienced professional crew that, that broke the error chain at the very last moment. And it is incumbent as we move forward and as we see emerging technologies 
that two crew members stay on the flight deck to prevent exactly what occurred in Austin. Yes, Mr. Hudson. Uh, some things that we've suggested in the past would be um, to involve NASA, not just the FAA, mm -hmm. in uh, what's been called next gen, which has been delayed or has gone through maybe five iterations. Um, secondly, that we need stress tests on the uh, computer systems, both the scheduling and the safety. We don't have that right now. And we would agree somewhat with, with um, the, the uh, doctor here that we should consider uh, standing up a new agency for air travel regulation and taking the, the safety aspects from the FAA and the, um, the economic regulation in transportation um, office of the secretary, which is really there by historical accident, and put them into a new agency that will really be focused on safety as well as good regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, Senator. I know how important air travel is to Alaska. So, um, well, believe it or not, I think we're at the end of the road here of getting uh, members to ask questions of our witnesses. I did want to clarify something, Mr. Watterson, on the question Senator Lujan asked. Um, how many tickets actually were canceled because of people? I, you gave a number, but then I wasn't sure if that was how many people had asked for refunds. Do you know a number of how many actual tickets uh, were canceled? Uh, I have the... Um uh, refunds, would that be sufficient? No, the, uh, no. I'm asking if you don't have it today, if you'd get that for us. What we're really trying to understand here, you can imagine if you're in any kind of oversight of mm -hmm. this, you really want to know how many people really had their tickets canceled. And then you want to know how many people you really did refund. So until you know that, you don't really know the answer. You know how many people submitted something. But what we really want to know is how many tickets actually um, were, were canceled that didn't fly. So if we could get that information from you, that would be helpful. Certainly. Thank you. Okay, so I thank all of our witnesses for today. We will have the record remain open for four weeks until March 9th, 2023. Any senators wishing to submit questions for the record, do so uh, in the two weeks from now until February 23rd. And we ask the witnesses to be able to return uh, that information to the committee by March 9th, 2023. And that concludes today's hearing. Thank you all very much.